Yeah. Anyway, it, it's funny about technical stuff, isn't it? Um, we, I think we're, we're definitely the mechanistic age is still around, and someday we'll have a holographic videoing from another dimension, and then we won't have all these wires and stuff. It, it, some of you that are younger, remember these times. Remember all of the preparation, all the video cameras and stuff like that. And, and then just imagine what it might be like in a better world. A world with free energy, a world with uh, holograms, a world of consciousness, a world of combined positive intention, a world of things working, actually working. What I'd like to do now is, uh, we're doing a segue into Project Camelot. And uh, I, I hadn't heard much about Project Camelot. I, I've known Steve Greer for a long, long, long time. I'm, I was one of the people that got Steve Greer into his area of inquiry in the first place. Um, and, uh, and then along come uh, these people that call themselves Project Camelot. And I said, hmm, I wonder what that's all about. And uh, little by little, I would start to cruise through their website and find out that what they're doing needs to be done. There's a very strong need for this, which is to interview uh, in a very friendly way, going way beyond what, let's say, George Nury does or Art Bell on Coast to Coast, uh, because these folks really go into depth. They do their homework. That's very important. <coughs> They actually read the books of the people <laughs> that they're interviewing. And uh, so there's this stable of visionaries, mostly elders, people that could uh, die any time. Uh, was there some? Uh, yeah. It's gone now. It's gone now. Great. Um, so what, 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 what these people are doing, I'm beginning to appreciate slowly more and more. And I had a really nice talk with with, with Bill this morning, and uh, Bill Ryan uh, f from England, who has a, a very eclectic background, and so does Kerry. And so they're, they're doing this project, and they threw themselves into it as volunteers at first. That's always a, uh, a sign that these people are really dedicated, because people that seek uh, funding right away um, before they actually do it, sometimes uh, they have a silver spoon in their mouth, and they don't really get a whole lot done. These guys have really, really gotten a lot done. And so when Bill and I were talking this morning, it suddenly occurred to me that not only have they been gathering information and doing it using video equipment and so forth, but they've been able to uh, respect the wishes of those whom they have interviewed uh, regarding what's on the record and what's off the record and that it doesn't necessarily have to fit within a sound bite. And so we have uh, now for the next three hours, three and a half hours during this conference, you're going to hear from them. And you're going to hear some of the, the sharings and stories. And I, I, I'm just so glad that you decided to come, Carrie and Bill and Kay. And uh, you're, you're on. Bill, Ryan, Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot. Just a moment here, we're going to get ourselves wired up for sound. Oh, okay, yeah, we have to grab them, grab loose. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we're both on short leashes here. <laughs> Which is not our accustomed style. <laughs> Especially not me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little too wild to leash, but at any rate. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, you want to start because you're always very good at, at the <coughs> overview type. Uh. Do I want to start? Okay. Um, we have a lot of stories to tell, by the way, um, some of which we haven't really told before, either because they're very funny or they're against us. And we've actually got to the point here where we're very happy to, to, uh, to tell a lot of stories against us. And <laughs> one of the ones that I really like, I really love it, is um, we had an email from somebody a few months ago who said, you know what, I, 
I was sure that you guys must have been a CIA operation. You must have been sponsored by those guys. But then I realized, actually, that the videos were so amateurish that you couldn't possibly... <laughs> My first encounter with Kerry Cassidy was when, was when um, I was speaking um, for my own particular sins at the Lofton UFO conference in, uh, at the end of February in uh, 2006, because I got tangled up in a really weird story that I'm happy to say a few words about, but not more than a few, um, when I was basically talking about um, a disclosure program that I had got myself inadvertently wrapped up with. And I was being interviewed by several people. The first time I've been ever by, interviewed by anybody. And um, it's like at five o'clock in the afternoon I was being interviewed by, by some guy and he brought his lights in and his cameras and he had a camera here and a big tripod and a camera there. And he had all these microphones and he spent about 15 minutes setting it all up. And this was for some kind of TV deal. And I never even made note of what it was or who it was or something. And that was at 5 o'clock, and then at 6 o'clock I was with Kerry. And Kerry came in with this tiny little camera, <coughs> put it on this tiny little tripod, and, and I thought, where's the rest of this stuff? <laughs> and then Kerry started talking to me. And, um, and that was it. And what I want to say about that is that this is the spirit in which, in which Camelot started. It started in the way that we would both encourage anybody else to start anything, which is that you pick up whatever it is you happen to have, even if it's just your own courage in your hands and nothing else, and start. And what's really important is the vision that you hold. And I want to acknowledge Kerry here, because really, in as much as anything has a, has a bit of a lineage, and we can go back and back and back, and where did it really start? But Kerry started the vision that was Camelot because of her own history with Hollywood um, way back prior to October 2005, when she got frustrated with the whole business and said, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, well, actually... So let's back up because as much as I like to take credit for things, um, I have to say that Camelot started with Camelot, um, the real Camelot in the early days. And um, we were both very inspired by that. And um, as it happened, I did interview him in Lo at Laughlin. Um, actually, initially I thought he represented the Serpo project you know, how interesting can that be? He's not actually the whistleblower. He's not actually the one telling the story. So I wasn't really excited to interview him. And when I first went up to interview him, he kind of hemmed and hawed and said, well, maybe I'll time later tonight. And then he said he wouldn't. Then he said he would. Um, but initially he had on email agreed to be interviewed. So uh, the interview did happen. And I was very impressed because he was very... Um, Balance. He, although he was a spokesperson for the Serpo project in a sense, because he built the website, not because he had anything to do with it in particular, and it was an alien exchange program that our government was involved in back in the early 60s, supposedly, by the way, and it's online in case you want to investigate further. Um, but basically, he was very balanced in the way he handled the questions, and I threw some some um, some some real left jabs, whatever you want to call it, um, right to, folks, <laughs> to kind of uh, see how riled he would get and to get to the root of the story, which is kind of my way, in case you've watched the videos. And um, he handled it very well. He, he actually had a, had a calm sense of humor about it. He, he didn't get defensive. And this, this counted for a lot with me. And uh, we eventually, we went to dinner. Um, we, we started talking, comparing notes. Um, we'd both been researching um, incredible amounts of, of material, conspiracies, you name it, UFOs, um, metaphysics, uh, spiritual disciplines, all our lives up until that point. So we both had quite a backlog, and it ended up that we had quite a bit in common. Uh, then I went on a trip to Egypt. My mother had passed away, left me a small inheritance, which eventually financed Camelot for almost two years. 
And um, I, I went to Egypt uh, with uh, actually Jordan Maxwell and William Henry, wow. and I, that's where I interviewed Jordan very briefly. Um, that was still Camelot hadn't begun, um, and on the way back from Egypt, I I was in touch with Bill. We kept in touch over the emails, and I um, and we arranged that I would come to um, England to visit him, and uh, so I did, and and we ended up going to Stonehenge, to a lot of power places in England, and we went to Tintagel, one of the um, supposed homes of King Arthur. And when we went to Tintagel, I don't know if you've ever been there, it's, it's a really stunning, absolutely stunning place on the, on the coast, and um, has a lot of uh, mystical and uh, interesting power around it. And uh, we were, were really struck by it, and we started talking about what could we do. Here we both had this incredible backgrounds, and, and Bill is a webmaster, myself is a filmmaker, we were both writers, we both had spiritual backgrounds. And we said, what could we do to absolutely change the paradigm that was going on and, and actually maybe force disclosure? So um, right then and there we created Camelot, and both of us were very inspired by the King Arthur Roundtable concept, where there were no um, leaders and followers per se, but that um, in the spirit of Arthur, uh, you know, everyone came to the table, it, w it was all balanced, there were no hierarchies, mm -hmm. and um, worked together for what could be a better ver vision of the future. And I believe that that was the initial King Arthur vision, and I do believe that both of us lived back in those times. And both of us were tapping into that uh, when we connected. And that hasn't changed, so um, it's very remarkable that uh, Mayor has these lovely um, Arthur-like visions and uh, the sword and, and all of that going on. And um, it was also a synchronicity, you know, that John F. Kennedy and, you know, sort of a vision of a better future that was at least implied, if not carried out, um, you know, when he was president, was also um, sort of um, an echo, if you will, out there, and, and we decided to call it Project Camelot because Project being um, sort of the, the forerunning name that most deep black projects contain. I, I worked for a short time at um, JPL uh, for NASA and um, helping in, in media, and uh, I, I, I was writing a screenplay called Project Moon Dust. I, I worked in Hollywood for like 20 years, and um, I was trying to pitch projects, sci-fi projects, uh, to open minds and change the paradigm, and getting absolutely nowhere. And that's why I picked up a, a home, you know, non-professional camcorder and just said, screw it, I'm going to make a, a documentary, and I'm going to go interview these people at UFO conferences because they got something to say, and I want the world to hear it. Um, so that whole thing just took off, and then we, we also, by synchronicity, Bill was in touch with Mr. X. Yeah. Um, just to say a little bit about that, that, that envisioning and, and sort of initial actualization, the planting of the seed of this Camelot um, when we were at Tintagel in Cornwall. Some of you may have had the same experience. It was one of those things, it didn't take hours and hours of agonizing strategic planning. The whole thing was completely visualized, visualized and agreed with, with a spontaneous, obvious synergy between us in probably about two minutes for that. We just spelled out between us the vision um, in, in the very broadest general terms. And within, a, literally, I think within one or two or three minutes, we had agreed that this is what we were going to do. And there wasn't the slightest bit of doubt. Um, if we had stopped to think about it, <laughs> then we would have thought all about the yes buts and the hang on a minute and why how, and how are we going to um, finance this and spend the time and kill us and all this kind of stuff. And this never even crossed our mind. It just sounded like fun. And actually that spirit of fun and what the heck, let's do it, has actually been what's behind this whole thing in, in the last two and a half years. And I mean, but at that time, we didn't envisage anything that was this large, we couldn't possibly have imagined that here we were in Vilcabamba, just a few feet away from somebody who is, who is, who is 
a um, uh, widely respected throughout the world as um, as a visionary and a physicist and an astronaut and in a different timeline might have ended up as being the first person officially to have set foot on Mars and so on and so forth. And I mean, it's become so big, the whole thing has just evolved in front of us like we're on oiled wheels with someone else doing the steering and someone else doing the powering. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as, um, as we have the opportunity during the day that we take very little credit for anything that's happened here. Um, in retrospect, you can look back and we can see that we make a great show. You know, I mean, it's like we've got the, uh, the Mulder and Scully, we've got the two different personality types, we've got the, the man and the woman, the American and the Brit, we've got the skeptic and the, well, the slightly more skeptic and the slightly more esoteric. Um, and we make quite a good stand up team. You know, um, <laughs> but we never thought. I don't think you should be complimenting us. That's really embarrassing. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so, but I have to say that also. I just I know people are going to ask this, and people have been asking us for ages. Why do we have the cheetah? And the reason is is because what happened was we ended up. Um, going to Africa because Bill was born in Africa and he was able to take me on safari and I one of the reasons I even came to visit Bill in England initially was because I knew that he knew about Africa and I am an avid fan of Africa I guess you might say and um, of Egypt and so um, we set out on a safari um, very early on in, um, in our travels as a kind of a break that we would take and so um, one of the times we were out there, I was able to shoot um, a cheetah, a real life cheetah that was, you know, a young cheetah and beautiful, beautiful animal. And we spent hours uh, video, videotaping him. And then um, when we were creating a logo for Camelot, um, I, was, I was actually, because I came from Hollywood, it was, um, it was my kind of smart ass nod, if you will, to MGM. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The, M the MGM Lion, <laughs> which is very, very famous, I think, uh, as a symbol of Hollywood, and you know, at the beginning of motion pictures. And of course, I always wanted to make movies, so I thought putting that as our logo at the beginning of our um, videos was kind of a statement. Um, also, the concentration on the eye, if you've seen our logo. I don't have my t-shirt on, but it, our logo. And um, the I being that we are watching you, just as you're watching us, kind of a nod to the government in that respect. So that's why we have the cheetah logo. And cheetahs are faster, and we, the internet was our medium, and therefore we're, we're lighter, faster uh, than the uh, MGM logo. Do you, you are. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right. So, um... When we actually started Camelot, we had, we actually had something to do. It wasn't just a blank sheet of paper. Um, Brian just now has mentioned the Disclosure Project, and we do not know Stephen Greer. We've never met him. We've never corresponded with him. We've never run across him in any of the conferences or on any of our travels. We would love to do that. Um, we don't know. We don't know how he regards us. We don't even know if he knows about us. Um, but like many of you, probably, I personally was inspired um, by the, uh, the 2001 Washington press conference, I think it was in May 2001, um, when Stephen Greer uh, did a very impressive presentation in front of a lot of invited mainstream media and presenting over a period of several hours. Uh, quite a number of people, some of whom have later become our own Camelot witnesses. And I remember this vividly because that I was driving in Scotland at the time, very late at night, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and this thing was being reported live by, um, on the radio. And I was so fascinated by what was happening, I could barely believe it. I stopped the car and I listened to it at the time. And um, sorry. Uh, actually, this is so typical. We're having some anomalous... Uh, sound effects in the background, and they've cut out now, so maybe you need to hold the mic a certain way, but yeah. um, uh, maybe hold it up there. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks. And as 
many of you probably have done. I found myself asking, well, what happened to the Disclosure Project? What happened to the videos that they promised to release? Right. What happened as, a, as an outcome of what seemed to be such a huge promise that was, that was, that was made publicly back in 2001? Now, I don't intend to even try and answer that question, and there's absolutely no implied criticism. But in, uh, to use the jargon of one of my careers prior to Camelot, which is actually working in business and consultancy, there seems to be a gap in the market. Um, <laughs> now, now I would actually say, as one of my, one of my uh, uh, using the jargon from another one of my careers as a team building specialist and a team building consultant, there's actually room for more people in this team. And we need as many people as possible putting their shoulders to the wheel to get this information out. And so this, so I thought, well, you know, um, we're not trying to supplant the guy, we're not trying to, to interfere with his intentions, but actually there are people out there waiting for information. So um, Kerry has a little camera, which I could probably put in my trouser pocket here, and so let's go, you know. And in my experience with the Serpo project, and let me give a nod to that, because some of you may not know about it, some of you may have read about it, some of you may have read criticism about it. It's all very weird. It involves um, a purported claimed uh, U.S. alien exchange program that happened back in the 60s and 70s. Um, I became tangled up in this because just like you guys here, I was in the metaphorical audience when uh, attached to a newsletter, uh, to um, an email news group where this material about this U.S. alien exchange program was being released from an anonymous source. And somebody in that news group said, you know what, this is interesting information here, we need to archive this on a website. And I was dumb enough to say, hey, I can do that, I've got time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I became the webmaster for this release of information that was coming from sources within the, defen the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, this is a very, very long story, which we don't involve, but there was something behind that. I got tangled up with a whole lot of people from the intelligence community. There was interference from behind the black curtain. Uh, we ended up having an encounter with, um, with one of the retired reserve astronauts who, who didn't go on the program. We, we've got a fascinating story about that. We actually met these people. It's all very real, it did happen, it certainly didn't happen like it was said on the website, but there was something going on. And just leaping ahead to what we'll be talking about later on this afternoon, um, we have a very interesting uh, uh, whistleblower who we are calling Jake Simpson. Some of you may have caught up with his testimony, which we reported on just in the last 48 hours. And this was such an inconsequential remark that I didn't even include it in the report, I forgot about it. We asked him over one of the many cups of tea and coffee that we had together, I said, hey, you know, that exchange program thing, did that really happen? He just said, of course it did. He said, there are many of them. Wow. You know, wow. Um, which has always been my standpoint. It's like once you've got... If you, if you assume the existence of visitors and you assume the establishment of communication, then the next thing to do is that we go over to that place, you know, um, with their help. And of course this has happened. Um, we can't prove it, but... That was the reality of the Serpo story. And I became involved as a webmaster of this, and I was the only available contact, and that's why Kerry interviewed me, because Kerry couldn't interview the real guys who were behind the scenes in the Pentagon who were releasing this information in some kind of a drip feed, probably as a test to see how it would be, uh, would be received, what would happen, and so on and so forth. The story got trashed, but we think it got trashed from the inside, because other people from the inside. There's a lot of black and white, black hat, white hat games going on behind the scenes. Pushing and pulling is about what's going to be released, what's not going to be released. They sabotage each other and disinform each other just as much as they do us. <laughs> which is really very interesting. And it's true. How do you spell Sherpa? S-C-R-P-O. S-E-R-P-O. 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 That was the supposed name of the planet, which is also probably not true. Um, later on, we got into, um, into a conversation with Another whistleblower, a very important guy in the history of Camelot, who somebody who we know very, very well, who, who, who we have given the pseudonym Henry Deacon to, 
which is a nod to one of the uh, one of the characters in the TV series Eureka. Um, Henry, one of the very, very first things that Henry said to us as a criticism of the SOPO project, where apparently a bunch of 12 American astronauts took nine months to visit uh, a planet on Zeta Reticuli 2, Henry just said, it wouldn't have taken nine months. You know. And then he started to talk to us about the beings that lived on the second and the third and the fifth planet of Alpha Centauri and so on and so forth. And... Um, Okay, but let's not get out of order. Let's not get out of order, thank you. Okay. While I was doing this, I had people writing to me. Um, and I had people writing to me because in my naivety, I had presented myself as a kind of honest everyman who was, who was just doing what I could do to help, and I wasn't calling myself any ADS, and I even put a picture of myself up there so they could see that I was real. And I just said, look, I don't know what's going on here, and I tried to be as intellectually honest as possible which is the kind of thing that Kerry was talking about um, in the little interview that I did with her that lasted about 10 minutes. But people started to write to me, saying, you know what, I've got this incredible story, and you sound like the kind of guy who might believe what I have to say, and I haven't told anybody about this. And I had a lot of interesting messages from people, many of which I haven't ever published, because because they just don't go anywhere. Just kind of weird, anomalous encounters, peculiar experiences, funny stories to do with people's involvement in the black ops, and there are many of those. You have to move your hand up, I think. Okay. Stay away from One of these battery. was somebody who said, I had um, an interesting assignment. He said, when I was a young man working for an aerospace company in Southern California, and he said, that he was working as a graphic designer for an aerospace company that was contracted to the US government, and he was asked if he would like to volunteer for a special assignment. And he said, sure, what is it? And after he'd signed his NDA, his non-disclosure agreement, and given a secret clearance, he was then told what the assignment was. And the assignment that he had never told anybody about for the 20 years following that assignment, except for his wife, was that he had what for most of the people in this room would be a dream job and that for eight hours a day for six months five days a week he started his work in a sealed vault with a guard outside the door and then he would be given a mail bag a big mail bag which was padlocked uh, with big padlocks he said and the guard would come in would unlock the padlocks and then would leave would close the door and then his job was to sort out an archive um, and label what was in the mailbag. And what was in the mailbag was UFO documents, films, artifacts, and, um, uh, and, um, and videos. Between 1947 and the early 1980s when he did this. And that was his job for six months. And he just said, he just felt like this was, you know, he was just like a kid in a candy store. He couldn't believe that he was being asked to do this job, and that's what he did. And he had so much stuff passed through his hands, he never told anybody at all. A lot of the stuff was sealed, but he read everything he could. And he wrote to me and said, this is my experience. And so, um, and I checked him out, and I slowly drew information out of him, very, very gradually, um, because I can kind of, t I mean, we can kind of tell now somebody who's a real whistleblower. A real whistleblower isn't somebody who says, hey, I've got this incredible story to tell, let me tell you all about it. A, whistle, a real whistleblower is somebody who writes to you with two lines of enigmatic information to see whether you're smart enough to figure out who they are. You know, that's actually how they work. You know. And we have missed one or two of those. You know. um, but, uh, and we know we've missed them because they wrote to us again and we didn't even notice the first email. You know, because you get a little one-liner saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you guys, I've got something interesting to tell you. <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay, what does that mean? Now we pay attention to mails like that. Okay. So, um, this guy was waiting in the wings for Camelot, as it were, and he became pretty much, um, pretty much our first interviewee, somebody who never had spoken to anyone else before on record, and here were we doing a story disclosure project of our own. Okay, so what happened was we, he didn't want to go on camera, so that was 
That was the beginning. Um, and But we ended up meeting him, meeting his wife, spending time with them. Uh, he was a really stellar individual. And we determined to interview him, but we figured out that you know he wanted his voice disguised, then he wanted his back to the camera. Deacon later, Henry Deacon would not even go on camera or, or have his voice recorded. So um, in the case of Mr. X, we, we did do the video, and if you've been to our site, you've obviously seen it, um, hopefully. Uh, he, um, it, wasn't, it was pretty much our first video together, although um, prior to that I had interviewed, um, because I was on, not only interviewed Bill, I was interviewing Rich Dolan, uh, Stephen Bassett, uh, Jim Mars, um, and Bill Hamilton uh, it, as part of my UFO documentary that I was putting together. And Bill Hamilton is a witness who is absolutely fascinating. He's one of the early, we did put him on our Camelot interviews, and um, he's, uh, he's got uh, numerous stories to tell, and if you're familiar with the field, you know that he's a very well-respected researcher who, who goes back a, lo a long way. And I would encourage you, if you haven't seen his interview, that you really ought to. He's got some, some stories about calling in UFO craft before Stephen Bassett, I mean, before, before Stephen Greer ever thought of it. And um, also um, encounters with, uh, I guess you might say, men in black uh, who came to visit him and so on. And he's met some of the most amazing characters and researchers in the UFO field way back, going way, way, way back. But what happened to Mr. X? Uh, Mr. X, unfortunately, uh, recently, very recently, has, has died. He died unexpectedly. Um, we don't know the cause. Uh, we were told, we were called by his wife. She was um, in a state. Uh, she, by the way, he, um, one of the things that Mr. X did was he did a recent audio interview. He was beginning to get braver, and he, we were just uh, speaking at the uh, Crash Retrieval Conference in Vegas about a month ago, and uh, for that conference he did a short um, audio interview with me, um, or both of us, but it's my voice you hear on the, on the audio, um, and uh, he was he was using his own voice. He was coming out slowly but surely a little bit more. Um, he kept his wife and his family separate from this. She is a lovely person. She's quite aware spiritually, and yet he he felt you know great resistance from her. She has a lot of fear, um, and so he, he never quite uh, involved her in in sort of some of the things he was doing online, sharing stories with people becoming braver as time went on. Um, at any rate, he, he died of a sudden heart attack. Um, all of a sudden, uh, he, in the middle of the night, right, it was around Christmas, uh, right before Christmas, I think, he was supposed to go shopping. He developed um, a headache. Uh, he, he then took a couple aspirin. He went shopping anyway. At three o'clock in the morning, he woke up. He felt very unwell. She took him to the hospital um, by 12.45, the following day, he, he had passed on. Um, we don't know if it was a targeted hit. We have um, not wanted to upset his wife by probing um, overtly into the matter. However, we do have some suspicions in this regard, as the powers that be are very good at this sort of thing. Um, unbeknownst to most people, he was thinking of going on coast. Um, and uh, most, no one knows this except us and, and a few maybe close friends. Um, obviously, we don't know if this had an effect. We don't know if, if his intention riled somebody. Uh, from our pers perspective and from his, we felt that the fact that he'd been involved in an aerospace com com company um, over 20 years ago looking at documents, it was real, really small potatoes that he, he would not be a target um, that it was old stuff and that who could ba back it up because he had no evidence to present. So we always felt that we, he was sort of under the wire as far as being a target. Um, obviously we live on. He's, you know, he's around. He's, he's, he's going to communicate, I'm sure, um, with, with us as a group because we all kind of incarnate as groups, as, as many of you may know. Um, so, you know, each of us has a mission, and he certainly fulfilled his. 
he was a, a wonderful, loving, loving soul, and, and we want to pay tribute to him, him here at this conference by, by stating just that. Um, so, so that's it. Um, now, one thing I want to say here is for anyone who's not been to our website, I'm, I'm assuming most people have, but you just never know. Um, our mission is that we wanted to connect with truth tellers and whistleblowers and researchers in the field of, you know, just across the board. Anything to do with the, uh, the old paradigm and converting into the new paradigm that would have to do with um, things like free energy. I mean, almost nothing is off base for us. Um, you know, we'll go into the health field. Um, when up higher... Your hand up off the battery. Okay. Um, with health professionals, with um, you know UFO researchers, with conspiracies, with government, we we've interviewed people who have worked um, in black projects, obviously, and we are also interviewing people that are channeling. Um, certainly, George is channeling. Uh, channeling is a big aspect of the witnesses that we've interviewed. It's something that hasn't been talked about much, but it's something we're going into more in the future. It's important aspect. Um, there's remote, remote viewing, so we really cover a huge gamut. Yeah, we've been called the 7-Eleven of the um, internet conspiracy movement, in the sense that <laughs> we have become a one-stop shop where you can actually go and you can find out everything you need to find out or want to find out without actually having to go anywhere else, um, and. Just as a, as, a, as a moment of levity, this might even apply to some of you here. We've had emails uh, 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 blaming us for a number of lost weekends that people have experienced when they got drawn so deeply into our stuff that they couldn't get out of it. <laughs> and um, it's become huge. It's, um, we've got 150 hours of videos there, approximately. Uh, everything is being transcribed, some of it is being put into other languages, we've got audio versions, we've done reports of our own, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't even talked about yet. And so, it's really grown arms and legs, but we do get people writing to us. Um, and please forgive this apparent self-promotion, but it is for really for the benefit of anyone here who is now coming up to speed with what it is that we're talking about here. That we think, and we have been told, that we do have paradigm-changing information on our site. Um, as I was saying earlier, this was never something that we deliberately set out to do, but it seems to have come that way, exactly for the reasons that Kerry just stated, that we are reporting information from so many different sources that, paradoxically and really interestingly, only the Black Ops guys will really connect all this together. In other words, what has got consciousness to do with energy, to do with multidimensional travel, to do with ET contact, to do with possible health benefits that have been withheld from us? All of this stuff is connected, and the powers that be know this. The real thing that stitches everything we've done together is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to set you free, as it were, with the truth that has been withheld from you, and the reason why this truth has been withheld from you is that there are people there who do not want you to be free. That's, right. That's the other side of the coin. And so we're trying to reverse this. And I really love Brian's bumper sticker reference yesterday morning when he said the truth will set you free, but first of all, it'll piss you off. I'd actually make an even bigger bumper sticker than that and say, first of all, it'll freak you out, and then it'll piss you off, and then it'll set you free. And I'm going to put that on the site with Brian's kind permission, because that is so beautiful, it's so true. And we get communication all the time from people who tell us Basically, what stage in this evolution, uh, in this progression that they're in, whether they're freaked out, whether they're pissed off, or whether they're feeling liberated by it. You know? And we hear from people who say, you know what, I was freaked out last week, but now I've read a lot more of your stuff, and now I'm cool. So what can I do about it? And this is, of course, the next thing that we're going to talk about, we're going to go on to talk about later on this afternoon, is what can we do? And this was, was, was brought out um, very well, I think, in the dialogue that we had yesterday with George Green. It's like, okay, now I'm freaked out. You know, what do I do now about it? You know, is it all about saving myself? 
what is it, you know, what do we do now? What do we do with this information? And this is something that we want to talk about a little later on, because we are very solution-oriented. We're not trying to freak people out, but the truth is where you have to start. If you're lost in the jungle, or even if you're lost in the streets in New York, and you want to get somewhere else, you have to know where you are in order to start beginning that, that journey. You have to know where you are. Even if you don't like finding out where you are, it's like, you know what, the truth is that I'm here. That applies metaphorically. If any of you have come across difficult situations that you've suddenly encountered in relationships or in your business or with your family or anywhere else in life, first of all you tell the truth, then you say, okay, this is it. Now, what do I do? See, it starts from there. Right. So, uh, we basically uh, are willing to tell you the truth about what's really going on. And we have found that people have different tolerances. And we do understand this. We are not, um, we've also been labeled negative and this and that um, because we do tell the truth. Um, what has been going on around us, and it was depicted best, I think, in the Matrix movie, is that everyone is in a matrix. Most people don't want to wake up from the matrix. Um, we're all about waking people up, so that, that's kind of our mission. Um, once you got, get awakened, absolutely, you want to do something about it. And we are uh, big proponents of encouraging people to do that on a consciousness level, as well as on a practical level. And we created a new website called Project Avalon, projectavalon.net, for those of you who haven't been there, that has a forum where people are connecting, even as we speak, uh, creating safe places to go to as a result of some of the things they've learned, because that's their choice. On um, the other hand, some are just building communities right where they live now. Um, they're just making connections, and that was our intention, that they would do that all around the world, and it's very, very inspiring that it's actually happening. Um, on top of that, Ab Project Avalon does contain all kinds of information we are cataloging and gathering as, as, as I speak. Um, things about, you know, how to build a safe house, how to, you know, where to go in the, in the world, what's safe, comparing notes on that, um, you know, different soil conservation, uh, water, you name it, okay. So that this is just a, a very quick reminder to tell you that we have been making plans and helping others to, to start to make plans to create something new in, in, the, in the wake of what is now becoming a destruction of the old paradigm. And therefore, um, you know, we want to encourage you and let you know that everything that happens here at this conference, any skill sets, any um, information that you want to share, you can take it to our forum number one and also um, submit it just as research material if you're experts in certain areas. We're going to make all of that available there, and we can certainly set up a, a section on Bill Kabamba in particular, if, if that's what would be wanted. Um, so from here, we can actually dig deeper into our wet witnesses, but I want to find out where we are in time. Uh, what time is it? We're quarter to 12. And oh, so yeah, you, you have minutes? about uh, 15, 20 15. minutes, yeah. How are we on the camera? Okay. So, How much tape we got? We got eight, um, 20 minutes. Okay, so let's do that over. We're going to do now an overview of what we call the big picture. And this is the other thing that, that we want to say is that each witness has a piece of the puzzle. And we, um, unlike some people that do interviews, and there are other sites out there, we're not just gathering, you know, random interviews about this, you know, subject matter, you know, and piling them all into a big bundle. We actually are on, if you will, a trail to, on a mystery. And we are collecting specific testimony that, that leads to a certain place. Um, and that's with an intention, to reveal the entire big picture in one place. And this is actually what, where the power resides, is, is not in knowing just a piece of the puzzle, but knowing the whole big picture. And I have to say that the journey isn't over that we feel that we've covered a great deal of the big picture. Some of it may be very superficially. Um, the deeper we could go, the, the happier we'd be. But we have been stopped at different intervals, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and we've also had our own um, anomalous occurrences. I won't call them overt threats. Um, that hasn't happened yet, you know. At, 
Um, but, but we will describe that as well. And we're gonna have a huge question and answer section as well for all of this. And I do wanna say that one of our witnesses is here, besides George Green, who was here yesterday, um, that we've interviewed. Uh, and her name is, as all, you, all, you, all of you will know, is Miriam Delicato. And we're very, very pleased that she was able to come. And we want to do special thanks, why not now, to Kay Shepard and Perry Shepard for making this possible. Kay is a, a real mover and shaker. And if it wasn't for Kay, we would not be here today because we have actually run out of funds <laughs> for financing Camelot, which is all self-financed up to now, um, except for some donations for the past year. So. Um, so it's it's because of Kay that we're here, um, and, and we want to give her a great nod of thanks. And, um, uh, and so now, what what we'd like to do is have, have Bill is the best at facts and figures. He's the physics major. He's you know, he's the one who can do this the best. So he will give you an overview of kind of the big picture, and then we'll we'll do lunch, and and after that we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll drill down deeper. <laughs> yeah, I'm the math and the physics guy. Um, and one, one of the first experiences I had with Perry was when we had dinner together um, after our interview in Laughlin. And Kerry was kind enough to, to pick up the tab for that dinner. It's a wonderful Mexico, Mexican dinner. And when she was given the, the bill, the check at the end of it. I saw her, you know, with furrowed brow trying to figure this out and she was just about to give this guy a $200 tip on the credit card and I said, wait a minute, you've got a couple of extra zeros on there. And, <laughs> and, and, and since then, we've had a running joke about that Kerry doesn't do zeros. You know, you know, it's, it's like, you know, is keto a hundred miles, a thousand miles? You don't know, you know, but and that's okay because because I can handle that. <laughs> There's a very funny story as well in Nairobi, Kenya, where we were when we went off just before we were filming the cheetah. And we needed a cup of coffee. Um, do you mind if I tell the story? No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we needed a cup of coffee. And this was the afternoon before we were about to go to Nairobi Airport to get the plane. And I said, hey, listen, you know, we need to go, uh, um, we need this and we need that. And you probably need, uh, maybe, you know, um, 3,000 Kenyan shillings or something. You know. um, and, Kerry, <laughs> and Kerry came back to the car in a state of deep distress with 300,000 Kenyan shillings, <laughs> you see, that she got from this 80. <laughs> from this 80. <laughs> Safety. I was like, you know, what's this zero? You know. Anyway. Well, um, actually, I have to say that the money started pouring out, and because I couldn't, I thought I would basically cleaned out the bank because they it just kept coming, and I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it either. But it didn't matter because a Kenyan shilling, as you probably gathered, isn't very valuable. Um, and we were able to change it back and all this kind of stuff. But since then, I'm the guy who handles the zeros, you know, meaning that I'm, I'm the guy who takes care of the numbers and the math and the physics. And I think Brian will probably make Brian laugh. Yeah, that's true of us too. <laughs> I'm not surprised. And it's great. And it's part of the dynamic that makes a great team, actually. You know. um, because when Kerry's got her head of head way up there in places where I can't even see, I've got my feet fairly close to the ground. Right. And we're kind of connected by some kind of cord most of the time, and that helps to keep things in balance. And so, having said that, now I want to tell you some pretty weird information, because things started to come at us pretty thick and fast. Um, very soon <laughs> after um, Kerry's interview with Bill Hamilton, which she was talking about just now, which is back in 2006. And Bill Hamilton, as some of you may know, is one of the people who, who was responsible for, to his great credit, for publicizing the story of Dan Burish. Wow. And um, way back in 2002, when, like you guys, I was busy collecting privately and quietly all the information I possibly could about everything that I could. And, you know, before that I'd read Timothy Good's Above Top Secret, and before that I was reading 
1988 and thinking, wow, I suppose all this is true. And before that, I'd had my own ET experiences, just as probably many of you have. But, but um, when Bill Hamilton published his own interview with Dan Burish back in 2002, um, I saw that on the internet, and something really hit me hard. I thought, this is amazing. This man is telling a detailed and complex story about time traveling, future humans, and some possible problem that is trying to be handled by these guys, all behind the scenes, and he's trying to tell this story. And I saw this video that, that Bill Hamilton had shot in an interview that he had done with Dan Bureau back in 2002, and it impressed the heck out of me. And I just found myself thinking, well, first of all, what I did was I emailed everyone I knew saying, you know what, you need to see this, because there's something really special going on here. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And, um, and as with many of the people who we've subsequently spoken to and been privileged enough now to even count as friends, I found myself, you know, it's just, I'd love to just be able to go up to it with this guy in a conference and just say hi, but it'll never happen. You know, gee whiz, these people are out there. And, and I mean, of course, since then, things have moved along quite a lot, and we're, we're, we're proud to consider Dan one of our personal friends. We can talk to, talk to you a lot about some of the things that he has shared with us. When we interviewed him, he t I mean, the first thing that happened was we immediately realized, we immediately both realized that this guy who's been disparaged all over the internet. We found him to be kind, brilliant, sensitive, witty, um, uh, uh, very humble, um, and clearly possessing a huge depth of knowledge about some experiences that he'd had, some of which were deeply troubling to him to integrate. And we, we got this very, very quickly. And this guy is absolutely rock solid in his testimony. And we were very, very privileged in a very early stage to, to be able to release um, a three-part video with Dan the Irish that we did, and I think it was August, was it August, 2006? Somewhere back there. And um, his story, um, for those of you who don't know it, and we can go into this in a little bit more detail later, because it's one of the threads, one of the, one of the main threads in the whole tapestry that we have later, that we later came to call the big picture, which is like, what is this all about? What is it that makes this time special? What is it that's going on? What is the ET connection? Why is it that 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 all of this has been it is so complicated and so secret? And those of you who were here yesterday would have remembered my contribution when we were sitting talking the four of us at the end of the day, talking about what Bill Burns had said about his his own conversation with Admiral George Hoover from the Office of Naval Intelligence before George Hoover died. And George Hoover, who Bill Burns uh, described as the Philip Corso of the Navy, said that the, one of the big secrets was that the Roswell visitors back in 1947 that there weren't little bug-eyed aliens from another planet, there were us from the future. There were time-traveling future humans. And um, that this is really the start of the complex uh, uh, web of problems, entangled problems, that the American government and other governments have been grappling with ever since, and have chosen, for whatever reasons, not to tell us about, because they didn't think that we could handle the truth. No. Um, well, actually, I have to say that the reason they, that there is a big picture and the reason of where we're going with all of this is obviously in the direction of 2012, um, these few years that we're, we're in now, and beyond, going up until what we understand may be uh, around 2017 and, and further. Um, so we're actually aware at this point that the big picture points somewhere and that these aliens that were coming here had a mission. And they were here because they wanted to prevent a catastrophe. A catastrophe that had happened in the past. And that, that resulted in what, was, what, according to Dan Burish, was the splitting of the human race into various factions that then took off, some of which went underground, some took off for other planets. And maybe you can, can carry it on from there. Yeah. 
the essence of Dan Burch's information was that, just as Kerry said, there were various groups of future humans with different future lineages who had encountered a catastrophe in their history and that prompted by what seems to be the altruistic intentions of a, a group which in Dan Burish's shorthand he calls the P52Ks. P52s refers to present plus 52,000 years. These guys set down was, uh, were from 52,000 years in the future. Um, he regard, he, um, some of them, one of the groups, the group that was responsible for, for initiating the, the retrospective time traveling intervention attempt, um, were, uh, were human looking, were very spiritual, were very, um, were very uh, well intentioned towards us, were being very careful in their approaches, and uh, he regarded them as best he knew from his own self-confessed limited information as Nordics. Now, there may be many Nordic races, and the whole thing is a huge complexity. We later on had testimony from uh, witnesses such as Clifford Stone and others. And just as um, uh, I think it was George yesterday made reference to, there are many, many, many different races, and the whole thing is incredibly complicated. So. The summary of that story is that Dan Beerus was reporting from his first-hand experience working as a microbiologist in S4 of Area 51, when he had personal encounters with one of these beings, not one of the Nordic beings, but one of the other guys who had a degenerate genome, because whether the genome degenerates or not, in, the, in this future timeline, depending on whether you go underground to avoid the catastrophe, or whether you leave the planet to avoid the catastrophe, the guys who left the planet straight off ended up in good shape. The guys who stayed underground for a while did not. And that's quite interesting. Um, now, of course, what we see is we do see a sort of, um, what I would call a vector, what I would call, um, it looks like the same sorts of things are happening. There seems to be some kind of instinct for the powers that be to tunnel underground when they feel danger coming. Um, according to the future human's testimony, that might not be such a smart thing to do. And we've got some really interesting testimony about that, which we'll report on later on this afternoon from our most recent witness, who we're calling Jake Simpson. We'll close off in just one or two minutes, because this information from Dan Burish was so fantastical. It left us with a sort of conflict. It's like, could this really be true? And yet this guy is absolutely straight up. We spent a lot of time with him on and off camera. And we felt that we believed his information, although it was impossible to believe. And we also felt that this guy was absolutely <coughs> credible in terms of his sincerity. Later on, just a few weeks after that, we met another guy who has become very, very central in the Camelot timeline, as it were. We called him Henry Deacon, which was, um, which was named after the brilliant polymath um, in the TV series Eureka. And Henry Deacon uh, was, is an electronics engineer, highly qualified, multidisciplinary, brilliant man, very spiritual, um, very um, uh, anguished, because it's quite hard to go through these experiences that these people go through, whether you're a black ops insider like Henry, whether you're Dan working with an alien in Area 51, or whether you're George working with the bankers or even whether you're Brian with the experiences that you've had, it's hard to emerge from all of this without scars and things that you think about deeply about later on sometimes. You know? um, and we need to understand these guys and the compassion that they require in order to understand their experiences. We mortals are not necessarily well equipped to understand what they've been through. But Henry had the courage to talk to us in a very noisy pizza hut with his cell phone uh, battery removed from his cell phone. That's the first time that we'd heard that that was a smart thing to do. Um, he knew a whole bunch of stuff. And he started telling us things 
that sounded a little bit like what Dan was saying. He was starting talking about time travel, and he started talking about a catastrophe, and he started talking about some of the things that he knew. And we said to him, look, this sounds like Dan Burish's story, and he didn't know who Dan Burish was. Now, we said to him, and we'll talk about Henry's testimony um, uh, after lunch. He has a whole bunch of stuff to report. He's been to Mars. He's been to the Mars base. Okay, we'll tell you about that. Um, but what we asked Henry to do, we said, look, go and listen, or go and watch our video with Dan, and tell us what you think. And he got back to us three weeks later, saying, Dan Burish is telling the whole truth, timelines and all. Okay. And that was a really important independent corroboration for us, that there's something very real, very important, and that this is one of the biggest secrets, that there's a complexity of, 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 of um, possible future timelines which the powers that be are trying to get information about, are trying to manipulate, there are pushy-pully factions, there are some of them who are actually trying to steer us right into the wreck, and there are others who are trying to avoid it, and you've got a whole bunch of ETs who are standing by, some of whom are trying to help, some of whom are watching, and some of whom are trying to take advantage of the situation by picking up the resources when it's all over. And um, Henry told us a whole bunch of stuff about this, which we'll then, I think, we'll go on to talk about after lunch. That feels like a pre-lunch wrap to me, what do you think? Um, okay, yeah, absolutely, very close. Um, I just want to say that uh, the catastrophe, according to Dan Burish, may have been averted. Um, we, he has a device called the Looking Glass that he w will talk more about. Um, we've done subsequent interviews with him, had subsequent meetings with him, and his uh, sort of sidekick, Marcy McDowell, who is a known um, operative from MJ-12, what is no longer called MJ-12, but definitely the organization exists. And uh, Dan was also working for MJ-12, that's another important note. Um, so the story is complex. Elements of disinformation may exist within it. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't question that. Um, where they exist is another matter, and, um, and, and, and it's a huge puzzle, as I said, to, to put all together. Um, but it, it's important to just have the caveat that the catastrophe, as seen in Looking Glass, um, that there's, there are um, elements of it which appear to be, have been mitigated at this time. Okay. <laughs> you ready? I'm ready. Uh, how far is all the cameras going? They are all, they are all going. Okay. <coughs> so, what happened just uh, before the break, before lunch, is that we ran out of camera tape just as I was trying to come to my punchline. So I'm just going to repeat that, because actually it's quite an important <coughs> little note for people to, to ponder on. And just to recap, where we were at was talking about this, this whole complex issue of alternative, uncertain, uh, unpredetermined potential future timelines and the future humans' concerns about that, and the governments and the militaries of the world's concerned about that once they first uh, became aware of the potential problems, probably back as early as the Second World War, so we have been told. And um, to illustrate that point, I had mentioned that we had been told by our most recent witness, Jake Simpson, who's been on our website for the last 48 hours or so, that, um, and this was, he's told us so much stuff that all the time we're remembering things that we haven't included in our little report, and one of these things is just a little off-hand remark. He said, there was a NASA satellite which has recently been launched with a trillion dollars worth of equipment on it, and that's a lot of money to put in a satellite. You ask anyone from Wall Street. Even Kerry knows that's a lot of zero. Okay. And I had to do that for the camera, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and, um, and this guy knows how much a trillion dollars was. This wasn't a throwaway remark. A trillion is a trillion and a billion is a billion. This is a trillion. And the point is that the powers that be 
don't put a trillion dollars worth of stuff in space that's going to burn up into nothing and eventually re-enters the atmosphere. If they knew what was going to happen, you spend a trillion dollars on a piece of equipment up there when you don't know what's going to happen. And if they don't know what's going to happen, we don't know what's going to happen, and that means that the game is uncertain, unpredetermined, and therefore open to be affected by ourselves, if we so wish. And anyone who knows anything about quantum indeterminacy knows that consciousness is king, and this is where the real world of physics interfaces with the world of the esoteric. And um, I think Brian would be one of the first people in this room to agree that you cannot embark on this string trail of exploration, research, and discovery. Even as a physicist, if you're intellectually honest, it will lead you into spiritual realms, and there's absolutely no escape from that. Would you agree with that? That's certainly yeah. correct. Yeah. You might want to hold the microphone up a little higher. Let's see. How does that, Good. How does that work? Okay. Okay. Well, that's like, right. angle it this way. Yeah, an angle it this way. Uh, is there any, does yeah. that sound good? Yes. Yeah, so this is a model for... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, you well, see the angle. Yes, What we needed was a Princeton PhD to straighten this out. Right. So, the issue here, which we're going to be talking about for a lot of the rest of the answer, <coughs> is what might happen. We don't have any definitive inside information of the nature that George Green was saying yesterday. We haven't got anyone saying to us, whether they're worldly or unworldly, that, you know what, World War III is going to start on the 1st of April. I don't know anything that says that World War III isn't going to start on the 1st of April, but we're going to be discussing, in an open sort of way, uh, that things do seem to be changing, that the future does not seem to be known, and that the 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 push me, pull you, sort of um, uh, tug of war between the different influences, both planetary and off-planet, is one of the things that is making this game uncertain, interesting, and influential at the moment. Um, so what we want to do is, is continue on drilling down with our various witness testimony. And again, the strength here is not just that we have whistleblower testimony, as well as researcher, um, as well as even channeled information, um, but that we're putting it all together in one place and adding it up. So, you know, two plus two equals four or five, whatever. So th that's, that's where the strength is in Camelot, and that's, that's what we're doing here um, for you today. So. Um, under that heading, what I want to tell you about is that over a year ago, we sat down with Dan and Marcy in Las Vegas on a private meeting, um, along with, by the way, an, an, I'm gonna, not going to name him, but a television producer, who wanted to bring our Project Camelot to the screen uh, as a television show. And um, he was working, has been working for the past year to do so. We originally had a deal with the History Channel, uh, they then decided from some higher up, about a week later, um, the word came down that right when they were about to sign a deal with us for a two-hour pilot show, um, basically, you know, mixed the deal and said, no, we would be a threat to their show, UFO Hunters, as if they hadn't thought of that before they made the offer. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, at any rate, nothing has happened in regard to that, but the interesting thing that went on between Dan and Marcy and the television producer and us, was that Dan had come back from an uh, intensive time working again with Majestic, um, under whatever name you want to call them, and uh, basically with Looking Glass, and that all bets were then off, as of over a year ago. Their time travel technology that is telling the future, um, which is an alien, um, you know, back-engineered device, was basically telling them the probabilities of things that had hap were going to happen. We had a whole report as to what, what certain things would be happening and how it would roll out. And Dan was telling us these things. One of those things was that Hillary Clinton would be president um, and that she would be killed in office. Now, as you know, that hasn't happened. That's not what's, what, what the timeline actually, how it, how it played out a year later. Um, there are several other things that we were told that were predicted in Looking Glass that have not 
transpired. Um, so, and, and, and you can, can add to this. Um, it was a very important <coughs> meeting. And it's very important for you guys to know about it because what is happening here is that you've got these scientists and you know Black Project, these people that are that are basically in the power position on the planet, using special technology to look into the future, and they're actually turning out wrong. Okay, and that means that there's something else at work on the planet, and that we're all a part of it. That's rolling out in a different way. Woohoo! I'm going to drill down a little bit more into what Kerry just to summarize, and she's quite right in emphasizing that this is, this is so very important. To understand this, to understand the way that the powers that be have been using the power that they gained probably as early as 1947. We heard from a couple of sources that one of the things that was retrieved from the Ros Roswell crash was some sort of, um, even Henry Deacon couldn't put this properly into words, it was like it was, uh, it was a very clever gadget, that highly advanced, which was connected with their ability to navigate in time, to control where they were in time, to know where they were in time, um, and you can use that kind of thing to see what's going to happen, what has happened, and it's like a sort of, um, these are my own words here, some sort of an interdimensional interface between um, where one happens to be and when one happens to be, and the entire flow of time that enables one to control and to perceive. Something like that. Now, of course, if you can imagine what happened back in 1947, when this interesting gadget was retrieved by a bunch of, 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 of interested Air Force physicists, they start playing with it. And when they start playing with it, you're really giving, um, no offense to any individuals here, but um, it's a part of the, the human condition, I guess, that if you give human beings uh, a dangerous toy, then they're going to start playing with it, and they may start doing some damage with it, just as children would. And what seems to have happened, as far as we can gather, is that that created a major tangle. It created a tangle in timelines that, that even though the future humans were trying to come back to do something to help avert this catastrophe, what was unplanned by them, and what made the tangle even worse, was that that intervention attempt immediately went wrong, because the craft crashed, because, because of the, um, the new high-powered radar that they had in um, White Sands, I think it was based, um, which is why these disks started crashing in the first place, because they couldn't actually interface with the radar. Um, was that the timeline problem then became even more complicated because you were giving the government the ability to see into the future and to look at the possibilities and probabilities of what might start to happen. And that just makes the tangle even worse. Um, it's extremely hard to lay this out in a, in a kind of comprehensive paragraph, but you probably get the idea. And this is one of the secrets that hasn't been told. And um, the reference to the project that happened in the latter half of 2007 is that um, Dan took a so-called sabbatical, Dan Birch took a so-called sabbatical for the best part of six months. I mean, he was really out of communication. We didn't know where he was. And on the 10th of January, he met, on the 10th of December, he met with us uh, in Las Vegas. The fact that this other guy was a TV producer was just incidental. He happened to be alone. He was a friend. Um, and he just sat with his jaw on the floor for five hours as Dan, Dan debriefed to us what had been perceived. And the purpose of this project that happened back in 2007 was because the, what had been communicated to the American government by the future humans was that the man-made Stargate and Looking Glass technology which is the same kind of stuff. It involves, um, a stargate is a stargate, as anyone knows who's been watching TV. It's something that you can step through and you end up in a different place or a different time. It enables one to travel. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, because this technology does exist. A 
looking glass is the colloquial name given to the same device used just simply as a way to look through it and see what's on the other side. You don't, you don't need to travel, you just take a look. And so it becomes like the high-tech version of a crystal ball where you get to look and see what's happening. Except that it's not quite as simple as that because what you see, apparently, or with the information that is retrieved, comes over in terms of probabilities and possibilities. And the details of that process we are not given to know. But in that project, sorry, let me back up a second there because this is complex. Um, the future humans told the American government that the catastrophe which was in their history, and this is where this stuff starts to entertain, it starts to intercept, inter, interface with the whole 2012 mythology and concern that has been building up over the last few years, is that there seems to have been a catastrophe in this timeline, in Dan's own words, round about now. Okay. He did not give a date. We don't know whether it's, whether it's going to happen tomorrow morning, whether it's going to happen 2012, or whether it's going to happen as late as 2020, whether it doesn't happen at all on this timeline. So there's something that happened round about now in the future of human's history. And apparently, according to their analysis, the reason for this was because the Earth was traveling through a particular area of energized space. From memory, I believe that he described this energized space as containing micro wormholes. And the, the man-made stargates and looking glasses caused an amplifying effect on this energy, on this energetic space. And that's what caused the Earth to wobble. That's what caused the pole shift to happen. So, this is all very useful information. No, no, um, wait, well, wait. actually, no. no I, this I, is I, extremely, I, this is extremely I, important. I, I, we don't. I'll give it to you. 30 seconds. The I reason... What I need you to do is talk to them about the different kind of ships. There, there's a magnetic and there's a pole. Explain yeah. that. Wait. <laughs> this is the reference to the leash that you heard about. <laughs> the important thing to understand here is that the future humans said that what you've got to do to stop this from happening is you've got to dismantle these devices. You've got to decommission these devices. All you've got to do is, first of all, you unplug them, then you turn them off, and then to be really safe, you split them up into three different components and make sure they're stored under different military agendas and different, uh, different, different military organizations in different parts of the world. Okay. Apparently, this was done. And then the reason why they went into um, this, this uh, project in the latter half of 2007 is once you've done all that, once you've decommissioned these devices, then it's like, well, now what? Has this worked? We don't know. We better take another look. And they, did take another look. and they did take another look. They took another look using a different kind of technology that they had for looking into the future. And what they found was... Um, was something which they evaluated as the most probable timeline was something which was labeled Timeline 1, Variant 83. And that's really interesting. Okay, but you didn't tell them, I'm not, I'm not really good at physics, so this is why I wanted you to explain to them okay. about the magnetic... See, because what happens is there's different levels of catastrophes. If you have a pole shift or a magnetic pole shift, it does different things to the planet. And this is where it gets into how many you know, humans are eliminated in the process. Okay, good. Yeah, right on. Um, our apologies for that. This happens all the time, by the way. On and off camera. And the reason for this is because this is not a linear story, you see. It's not like saying, okay, this is what happened on my holidays, and this is day one, this is day two. This goes everywhere. It's not a linear story. Everything connects with everything else. And this is, of course, exactly the problem that George Green has in telling his story yesterday. Um, it doesn't go in a straight line. Now, okay, so we bookmark that, and we go back to that in just a moment. And what Kerry was referring to there is the difference between a physical pole shift and a magnetic pole reversal. These are two different things. And one way to illustrate that, actually, is to refer to a piece of testimony that we received from somebody who was really in a position to know, which we've never publicized. And um, we've talked about it, but we haven't put it on our site because there wasn't enough information to make it a kind of big deal. But it's just another piece of the puzzle 
that fits with everything else. And this happened. Do you remember what I said just, a, just before lunch? I said that the most interesting emails we get are the ones that do this one line. And we got an email from somebody who said, great site, I love your work, keep it up, and then signed it with his name. And I thought, wait a minute, I know that name. But it was a common name. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't um, such a complicated name that you would figure out that, uh, that this could only be the one person. There are probably a number of people called Brian O'Leary, for example. It's not, an un it's not that uncommon. And so if this person, Brian O'Leary, it wasn't Brian, you know, who, who, it's like, are you that Brian O'Leary? Are you that, are you the person I think you are? And he wrote back and he said, yes, I am. Okay. And anybody could have said that, but we checked out the email address and the IP address and all that kind of stuff. And this was the man. And this guy was somebody who is a brilliant scientist whose name would be known to half of the people in this room. Uh, somebody who Brian probably knows and we can tell him in private and uh, who we felt that we should never actually release his name because that wasn't what he was trying to do. He was just trying to say, hey, I love your site. And he's on the internet, and I paid very close attention when I re once I realized that this guy is writing to us. And I said to him, very much on impulse, you probably know something which might be of interest to us and our, our uh, visitors to our website. Is there anything about what's going to happen in the next few years that you would like us to know? And he said, yes, he said, I'm limited about what I can say, but I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but we're going to have a very tough time. And this is really quite significant, because he didn't, he wasn't trying to feed us with disinformation. He was just somebody who said, hey, I like your site. We could easily not have picked up on this. I just happened to notice it, and I figured out that this was the man. And so I asked him. And he said, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. There are three things that are going to be happening in the next few years. He said, the first thing is there's going to be a corona mass ejection. And uh, he referenced, and this is a little bit of homework for all you guys to do, he referenced the event of 1859. Go look it up, quite interesting. Huge solar storms all over the world. If there had been any kind of an electromagnetic grid in 1859, it would have been wiped out. Okay, but it wasn't. They just had auroral displays as far north and south as the equator, spectacular sunsets for two or three days, and everyone said, wow, look at the colors in that sky, that's incredible. Okay, but it was a corona mass ejection. So when the sun has a hissy fit and it kind of throws something at the Earth that interacts with the magnetosphere, ionized particles hitting the atmosphere, all kinds of stuff goes on up there. Nowadays, that would be really bad news if that happened. He did not say how he knew. And this is really interesting to the physicist amongst you. Because you know that the sun randomly ejects all kinds of stuff in any random direction. It's a little bit like a cowboy shooting off a six shooter, spinning wildly around in circles and kind of firing randomly all around him. If the earth happens to be in the way, then that's bad news. But it probably wouldn't be in the way. He said this was going to happen. We don't know how he knew. Okay, That was event number one. He said this would start in 2009. Here we are, January the 11th. Bariska's birthday, by the way. Yeah. Forgot to mention that. Um, that's an aside. Bariska. Uh, let's go into oh. that we'll a little bit later. <laughs> Bariska Priyanovich, the indigo child. Okay. Then he said there would be a magnetic pole reversal. A magnetic pole reversal, which is already underway. But he stated this in such a way that it would be significant news and important for us to understand why. Um, and later on, and this is just a footnote to that, Henry Deacon, our physicist, black ops, insider source, helped us to understand that as far as he was aware, the shifting magnetic field in the Earth is something that, in, that affects consciousness. We are all electrical beings. We're souls in an electrical body that is dependent upon the, the neurological... Um, uh, uh, bioelectric activity of the brain and the body in order to function well. And if you've got something so profound as the Earth's magnetic field that starts doing weird things, then human beings are going to start doing weird things too. And so are dolphins, and so are whales, and so are all kinds of animals all over, all over the world. And, and Henry said, have you noticed that in the last 10, 15 years, 
there's been an increase in conflict, more people are misunderstanding each other, there are more people who seem to be going crazy, there are more people who seem to be behaving in irrational, strange ways, not connecting with each other. He said, this has all got to do with the changing of the Earth's magnetic field. And, and that suddenly, went, I did a big click with me personally, I thought, now I understand. Okay. But a magnetic pole reversal isn't going to, isn't going to necessarily going to spoil your whole day. It's, it's happening already, as best I understand. Brian can probably help us understand this better when we talk to him tomorrow about all this. And then the third event, he said, was the big one. He said, the third, he said finally, there will be a pole shift. Oh, um, a pole shift. A pole shift is a physical pole shift. A, fold, a pole shift is when the Earth was like that, and then goes boom, like that. It suddenly shifts. And any geologist will tell you that this has happened many times before. Most of you know what this is. It's a physical, um, it's a physical shift in the orientation of the Earth relative to its rotation around the sun. But it causes things like tsunamis, uh, continents shifting, uh, going under the water, uh, Atlantis, for example, pole shift. Um, and what it's caused by, I'm, you know, I'm not sure they, they know. But among other things, um, the interesting thing that is happening here is that we're telling you about a scientist who is highly, highly respected, okay? And who has suddenly been, he told us this much, asked to come on board to work for, of all places, <coughs> Homeland Security. And this is a man who was published on the web who was clearly actually sort of anti-government, um, was something of a rebel in his own right, was again still maintained his, his respectability because of the level of scientist that he was, or is. And so it was very valuable that he would even come back on an email like that, uh, revealing that much. All he did was list three things that were going to happen, the fact that he worked for Homeland Security, and the fact that he couldn't say anything more. And that is the last, I believe, uh, we wrote back to him, obviously. And uh, that's the last we heard from him. Now, this is happening at the same time that we're getting the information from Dan Burish. So you see how, and Henry Deacon. And so as we pull these, these threads together, and these people coming from completely different directions, with completely different motivations, are coming to us with the same story. Right. Um... So now Just go back final, to yeah. what Dan told us. Exactly. Um, our source here just finally, he apologized for not being able to say more. He said that we were the first people he communicated with outside the national security community for a number of years. We took that as a great compliment and as a risk that he was taking on his own part. He said as much as he could. Going back to what Dan said. Now, this guy communicated with us um, from memory. It was around, it was in the middle of Dan's project. It was around about the middle of 2007. Some of the whistleblowers who speak to us don't have up-to-date information. Um, or they hear it from a colleague of theirs. They have their own grapevines. They have their own rumor mills. Um, they don't necessarily are coming straight from a briefing that they had that morning. Okay. So it's not necessarily up-to-date information. And just to backtrack on where we were with Dan and the story of these man-made stargates and the looking glasses needing to be decommissioned because that was what was going to cause the catastrophe. And then, wait a minute, we better check to see whether this has worked. And then they took another look using an alien device, and what they saw was that the most probable timeline was the following. Now, in terms of nomenclature, the catastrophic timeline, which the future humans reported that they had experienced, was known as timeline two. I don't know why it wasn't called Timeline 1, but it was called Timeline 2. Okay. Timeline 1 is the other one when that doesn't happen. Okay. So are we on Timeline 1 or are we on Timeline 2 is as important as knowing whether you're heading north or heading south. It's, it's a pretty important distinction to make. And the first thing that they established in that time portal intelligence probe, which I think is what Dan called it formally, is that um, we were on Timeline 1. That's the good news, okay? The catastrophe he reported had been averted. We were on timeline one. And so once you figure out that there's not going to be a catastrophe, the next question for curious scientists is, well, okay, well, what is going to happen then? Okay, and then this is the, the variant 83 part, when they started to drill down into the detail of what would be happening in the next few years. 
Um, but I want to say that interestingly, and this is on our site, most of this information, so you don't need to be taking notes. Um, but, and we will be taping this as well for release. Um, he, Dan said, so we, then we were in interview with him at one point. We said, okay, that's great. And then he said, but there's no free lunch. And then he proceeded to tell us what that meant. And basically, timeline variant 83 contained things like nuclear war and um, you know, other fairly dire predictions, among which, as I said, Hillary was in office, was going to die in office. He had highly respected her. Oh, I have to back up. There's one other part that you guys need to know, which is about the Yellow Book. Um, and the technology that allows the world leaders to see their own future and then plot their lives accordingly um, to the best version of that future. And that is part of the reason why they are highly successful and remain so. Um, because they are actually cheating. <laughs> and uh, in, in, in regards to Hillary, what Dan said is that she was one of the people that had access to this technology, was given the yellow book, and looked into her future and saw that she was going to be assassinated in office. She was, he said, this is his story, um, willing to go into office knowing that she would be assassinated. And therefore, he had, um, she had garnered his, his respect. And this was, you know, back over a year ago. Now, it's now 11th of January, and Obama's inauguration is in nine days' time. And so, it's a pretty safe bet to conclude that this, that wherever we are at the moment, we're not on variant 83. That hasn't happened. This is the good news. Okay, this is more good news. And it's more good news in the sense that the package of information that was called Variant 83, that was evaluated as being the most probable future visible at that time, it did contain bad news. It, it did contain a war uh, against Iran that was predicted to start in October, last October. Okay. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, there was a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan. The jury's out. Okay. Um, there would be a financial collapse that was triggered in that timeline by the Iran war. Well, the financial collapse is probably planned anyway. Okay. It's set off. Uh, it's a kind of controlled demolition of the economy, which was set in place long before, which most of the people here know about, and which George already spoke about extensively yesterday. And he said that, um, that in this war that was seen, um, it would last through until 2010, Russia and China would become involved, and it was all pretty bad news. And, you know, based on that reality, Yorka Bamba sounds like a pretty good place to be, and we're actually marching in step with what George said. But, Hillary is not the president. The war with Iran did not happen in October. We are not on that timeline. And if we're not on that timeline, it means that we don't know what's going to happen next. If we do not know, it is not known. We haven't spoken to anyone who does know. And if I had been a betting man, I would have placed quite a lot of money in a black kind of way, as it were. Maybe this doesn't sound too good, actually. This is a metaphor. Okay. About, we had so many parallel information points that, that in terms of data clustering on a graph, Everything pointed to something happening last October. You know, everything happened. We were all watching it. You know, we had. I mean, um, something that we have already spoken about publicly is that our guy Henry Deacon, um, at the end of September, he he told us that he had received a telephone call. He said he's never received a telephone call like this in his life. He was asked to report for duty in the Middle East the next morning. Okay. He said he was almost ordered to do it, except that they couldn't actually order him to. He was asked in a way that he almost could not refuse. The rate of pay was $800 an hour, without overtime. Okay. Um, that's a very great amount of money. Even in that field, it's quite a lot of money. He turned it down to his very great credit. He said, I don't want any part of this. He was never told why he was asked to report for duty in the Middle East. Why? We don't know. Nothing's happened in the Middle East yet, except that something seems to be cranking up. Whether that fire is going to burn out on its own, or whether it's going to crank up into something much bigger, we don't know. This is the conversation we had yesterday. Um, okay, um, so, but we have had 
uh, whistleblower testimony that we have not been able to release in total, some of which we, we, we did release, um, from a witness who supposedly was in close um, communication with the Illuminati, who was saying that their um, agenda was rolling out just as planned, and that he was basically going underground and would not be able to communicate further. Um, we've been talking um, back and forth with this man for over a year. Um, I have to tell you also that, and he was basically saying, you know, the dire, somewhat dire agenda, depending on how you want to look at it, which includes things like elimination of the population that George was talking about. Most everything that George enumerated yesterday was going along, and that it was absolutely, it may be behind schedule, but that it was shortly to sort of ratchet up. Um, on top of that, uh, we have had other whistleblowers from behind the scenes coming forward saying things are on schedule. We also have someone who we've been in communication with for over, possibly even as much as two years, who is a good friend of um, Alex Collier, and uh, he has been telling us um, about his information that he has from some NSA sources that has basically um, geared him up to building an underground base in an undisclosed location. He has told us about um, the uh, Queen of England, who has now got an underground base being built in uh, part of Colorado. Um, so there are... And, and, and he's also a, a very wealthy man, um, and I can't tell you how he made his money, because that's, that's a highly um, controversial versial matter, but um, he basically said that he knew when the banks were, were going to go on bank holiday, as George does, and he's been in constant contact with us. Um, what's interesting in, in all this mix is that some of these people coming forward seem to all be agreeing on at least the agenda. In other words, we haven't talked about Bill Deagle. Bill Deagle is somebody who's highly controversial, who's you know, was a doctor, a medical doctor who's on the web. You may know of him, may have seen our interview with him. People, you know, ranted us, at, ranted and raved at us for having interviewed him um, because they felt he's too negative. They didn't want to hear it. They think, you know, he's he could possibly be programmed. He's been given testimony from other whistleblowers that we haven't as their doctor in working in black projects that outline, you know, like, a laundry list of their plans and their agenda, just as George has been telling you, that involves eliminating a population, you know, using viruses to do so, and you know, when, where, how, and so on. He's also highly intuitive and feels he has channeled information that tells him certain things. One of which was October, that October was gonna be uh, when this whole thing kind of came underway. Well, actually, it appears, okay, and I have to say it appears that he has been incorrect, at least thus far. Um, we've got David Wilcock, who is a, you know, a well-known psychic, intuitive, who is also highly scientific and has a very well-known website called divinecosmos.com, who can give you the scientific basis for what's going on, um, what he feels is the heating of the planets. He works with Hoagland, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Richard Hoagland. So what happens is we get all this testimony, and some of it is corroborative, um, some of it is not, some of it is conflicting. What's interesting is that it's, it's almost like, um, you know, and I, maybe this is a, a slightly um, cold analogy, but it's almost like watching a game in which there are predictions as to which side's gonna win. And, uh, and, and we're guess, getting people that are sort of calling the shots and calling the, the plays, if you will. Um, but I have to say that when it appears that something hasn't happened, for example, in October, there are a number of reasons why that might be the case. It doesn't actually necessarily mean that certain things haven't happened. It could mean that these viruses have been put in place. It could mean that they've been activated. It could mean they're not showing up yet. It could mean we need another six months to see that. If you talk to Bill Deagle, that's probably what he'll say. Um, on the other hand, it could mean the White House hats in the government, and this is a very 
you know, important part of it, um, have been successful. There has been, from what I understand, even in the last year, something of a coup in our government in the United States, which is not necessarily, I mean, Obama is a front man, and he was long prophesied to be, or planned to be the, the, the leader at this time. However, um, there is reason to believe that there are people, part of which is Majestic 12, from our, our understanding with Dan and Marcy, that are working in our white hats and don't want to see the elimination of the population. Some of the Majestic 12 are absolutely part of the Illuminati and they do want to see the, these things happen. So you've got, you've got fighting in the ranks and the fact that we're up here telling you all this is testimony to the fact from if you talk to Jake Simpson, if you talk to Dan Burish, that we have people or friends in high places that are allowing us to do so because they're actually white hats. Um, so it's a really important ingredient in, in all of what we're, what we're saying. I think this, I'm, I'm just kind of taking pause to, to think where we should go next with this at the moment. Shall we go to Jake Simpson? I think so. Sounds good. Okay. Jake Simpson was somebody who we met on our, on our long, month-long, there-and-back Australia trip when we were invited to speak at the Nexus Conference in Brisbane in October. And on that trip, we met a, we met, met a whole bunch of people. When we were on Koh Samui, Koh Samui is a beautiful uh, island in Thailand. Anybody been there, Koh Samui? Wow, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous place. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit like Vilcabamba in as much as... Um, quite a quite a number of people quite a long time ago uh, passed through there and then thought, wow, what a wonderful place to stay. And uh, it's full of expats and it's got its own sort of alternative community, but um, they do have the equivalent of those uh, interstate freeways going through the valleys, sadly. Um, it's been pretty much trashed. And of course, the, one of the reasons why it's been trashed is because they built an airport. That's the end. Yeah, yeah I want that. Yeah. No. Anyway. Um, beside the point, personally, there we were. So we met Jake Simpson, um, and <clears throat> the first preface that I want to make to this information is all on our site. We wrote up as much as we could. Well, we wrote up as much as we could remember, and um, we spent we spent three days, or maybe it was even four days, with this man and his family and his children. And uh, he's a delightful brave man. One of the first things he said to us was that um, when he first encountered our information, he wasn't sure if we were real or not, unquote. <laughs> he used his own um, uh, intelligence gathering context to, to check us out. He looked me in the eye, he said, I checked you out, he said, I know everything about your life, you've got nothing to worry about. He said, uh, he said, it's all cool. He said, I know that you've been telling the truth. And then the other thing he said, the next thing he said, was anyone else who's ever tried to do exactly what you're doing is being killed. He said, so I really admire your courage. And this guy is a warrior, okay, in the Jedi tradition. He's quite a, quite a remarkable man. And that was a very high compliment from him, that, that he should uh, be respecting our courage. And just to loop back into what we were talking about earlier on, when we first started before lunch, um, we're not standing up here trying to trying to be courageous. We're just having fun and doing what happens naturally and we're just saying, well, this is who we are and we've got nothing to hide and, you know, it's the Bill and Kerry show and so on and so forth. Um, and other people are saying, wow, you're so brave. But actually, one of the, one of the things that I think um, unites Kerry and myself very strongly is that I have no fear. Do you have any fear? No, I actually don't. And, and I, I'll address that briefly so it's, it's sort of a sidelight. But... Mm. Um, basically, the weird thing about us embarking on this journey is that we, um, we both happen to be the kind of personalities, I guess, it's a personality type, that um, sort of go forward in, in a very optimistic way, and we just don't look over our shoulder. Um, we tend to just do what we do, and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, so we're not, we're not paranoid. Um, I'm not afraid at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a rebel at heart, so that was, that was easy from the beginning. Um, and then, you know, obviously Bill wasn't afraid, so 
Um, it's kind of weird that um, we do what we do, but I don't. We don't see it as as something that that would cause fear. It's it's more um, a wild, exciting adventure, I guess, if you will. Um, what we what I'm not good at is you know sort of a more drone like existence <laughs> in which you would have you know the same thing every day and and you would be predictable in, in certain ways. Um, so so I think that's in our favor. And. Kerry's not afraid of, of Majestic, the NSA, the CIA, the DIA, the DOD, or, or the Illuminati, but she's not good with big spiders. Right? That's true. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, on a more serious note, um, I'm not afraid because I know I'm an immortal being. They can't kill me. They can't kill you. They can't kill any of us. That's another lie that we've been told ever since we were old enough to understand what our teachers were trying to tell us. We're not animated hoxamy. We're immortal spiritual beings who happen to be driving these... Who, thank you. Who happen to be driving these vehicles, as George loves to say, this road director. You know. um, and uh, I like to say what Obi-Wan Kenobi said in Star Wars, if any of you are familiar with this... with this... Um, with this... this uh, a wonderful movie, all that myth, all that fact-based in myth. You know. If they kill me, I'll just be more powerful than they could ever imagine. Maybe that's why they didn't learn. I mean, so, I mean, if they kill me, I'll just come back. Okay, so let's do Jake Simpson. Let's do Jake Simpson. <laughs> that's where we were, right? <laughs> Jake is a remarkable man. Um, and the spirit of fun, I think, which is another thing that, that Kerry and I very much had in common. He has the same thing in common. And also, like George, Jake would be talking about all kinds of things that will make our eyes bulge, and he'd just have a big grin on his face because he's been living with this stuff for a long time. And, um... Like what? One, like what? Like what? Here we go. Okay. Um, I'll try and remember the stories that he, t that he told us. And there's four days' worth, and it's not necessarily a linear story. First of all, um, he referenced, um, just in passing, some of the information we had on our site about the creation of the super soldier program, as described by Duncan Finney and David Corso, and a whole load of other people who contacted us privately who were involved in that. The powers that be, the intelligence and militaries of the world, are very, very interested in enhancing the abilities of humans, and they do this in a number of different ways. Um, uh, one of the things that they did with, with Jake, interestingly enough, is they figured, for whatever reason, that it would be, um, it would be uh, useful for them to enhance his cognitive ability. So they enhance his cognitive ability, because these guys can do all kinds of things. He has a reading and comprehensive comprehension speed of 80 to 100,000 words per minute. That's a lot of zeros. Okay. Um, as a test, when he went through this program to check out of that particular um, that particular training, he was given George Orwell's Animal Farm, um, and he was asked to read it from cover to cover in three minutes, and then he was tested. And he was tested like, what does it say, you know, on the top left of page 154? You know, um, he got 90 percent. That wasn't the it wasn't the highest score, but that was enough for him to be a pass. I guess that's why he wasn't in the FBI. He wasn't a 60 presenter, right? Yeah, okay. Um, that was one of the first things that caught my attention. And we actually, we saw some of this remarkable ability in action when we were with him. We actually witnessed it. It was really very interesting. One of the things that would happen when we were talking with him is that he would be, uh, for instance, we'd ask him a question, and he'd dodge the question he'd sort of slip away from it, make a little joke, and change the subject. And then 10 minutes later, he'd answer it. And after a little while, we saw this as a pattern, and we said, well, why are you waiting for a little while before you answer this question? Why are you waiting sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for half an hour, sometimes till the next day, and sometimes you can answer it immediately? What's going on here? And he eventually helped us understand that what was going on was this. And this is really, really interesting. And it's just the tip of the iceberg of a whole bunch of incredible information that you told us. He said there's an artificial intelligence system that operates in hyperspace. That is how they keep track of what people are saying, if they want to. What people are saying, what they're thinking, 
And not only that, he said, if, I want to, if they wanted to find out what Julius Caesar's last words really were, they could find out. He said, this is an enhancement, it's a human enhancement of alien technology, and he said, this is so advanced that the ETs are not happy that we've got it, because we're not using it right now. And that's what he said. And he said, this, uh, this um, uh, monitoring capacity, and this dovetailed directly with something that we'd heard from Henry Deacon, because I talked to Henry about a conversation that I'd had completely separately, and this is this is a whole different story, long ago, this is another Coast of Movie um, thing, a, a, a lot of interesting whistleblowers end up on Coast of Movie. Back in 2000, long before Camelot, I ended up talking to a guy who used to work in Bell Labs. We were walking along the beach, and this guy was uh, telling me an incredible story. At the time, I thought it was incredible. Um, going along the store, uh, walking along the beach, because he hadn't wanted to talk to me about this in his own house. I told Henry the story, he said, it won't make any difference where you talk to somebody. So it doesn't matter where you're on the beach, in the forest, in your bedroom, you know, or inside a lead-lined cage. He said, it makes absolutely no difference. If they want to hear what you're saying, they're going to hear what you're saying. You know? And now, Henry didn't enlarge on that, but when Jake started to tell us about his technology, then I started to understand it works in hyperspace. It's a hyperdimensional thing. Um, I, I can't even imagine the details. But when we started to, to ask Jake, we said, look, this is incredible stuff. I can't believe that these people have this, this sort of technology. I can believe they've got, they've got advanced craft, and I know they can do strange things, but this is really you know, out of this world. And he said, listen, he said, black technology, meaning black physics technology, or the physics that they use in black ops, is probably something like 10,000 years ahead of public sector technology. 10,000 years ahead of public sector technology. And it's accelerating away from the state of public sector technology at the rate of 1,000 years a year. That's how far come they can do this stuff. He said, you have no idea what they can do. They can do almost anything. And this is uh, the remark that Brian was saying yesterday about Arthur C. Clarke's comment that any sufficiently high technology has uh, would be actually indistinguishable from magic. We're almost at that stage already, as far as we can understand from what Jake was saying. Um, and yeah, he um, just to, to sort of drill down a little bit into the time, what was going on when he would answer the questions or not answer the questions. Um, one of the things he would do is say, wait. And we say, wait, wait for what? <laughs> and um, then he would say, okay, it's all right now. And it's important to know that he was a trained remote viewer as well and a highly developed intuitive that helped him in his, in his um, various jobs that he did around the world for, um, for the secret government, in essence. And um, what he would say is, it's coming round again. And it's almost like, um, I, I guess, a traveling beacon in which it, it, would, it would zone in or it would be gone. And he could, he could in, tap into when he felt they were sort of listening in, and when they weren't, and that's when he would, would tell us stuff. So, so that's how the conversation progressed. Um, I, I'm not sure, well, okay, let me, let me say that one thing that has been left off of our discussion with him, he talked also about, um, as you may know, John Lear, has talked about um, under Area 51 and under Nevada, there's very likely a high-speed train that goes underground between here and places like Pine Gap, Australia, and various other bases, including, I'm sure, um, CERN in Geneva. And um, basically, that's how they move people around. Um, and he, he actually uh, you know, attested to that, as well as the fact that John Lear has said that he's gotten inside information about this. So this is where... Again, we're getting more than one whistleblower um, from completely different places that are in agreement. Um, I want to say here also that uh, there's an interesting thing that goes on with whistleblowers. Um, they're human, like anyone, and they often fluctuate as to how much they'll reveal to you at any given time. So the whole there's a whole psychology um, that we've had to sort of learn um, by experience as we've started to interact with these people in dealing with um, some days they will be able to tell you things and they will feel brave and you know sort of 
rebellious and, and tell you whatever they want. And the, the next day they're telling you that, you know, they actually can't tell you anything. Um, they can't talk about this, they can't talk about that, and they're worried about the safety of their, their family and loved ones. So it's important to know that they blow hot and cold. Um, in, a, in the case of Henry Deacon, he's, um, he's, he's been quite an interesting witness. One of the people we've gotten to know almost maybe better than anyone um, and in some ways. And he worked for Livermore Labs. He worked for uh, places on the planet that are um, highly sophisticated, that have technologies that are um, really beyond, as, as Bill was talking about, he was hands-on with those technologies. He was involved in 9-11. Um, he knows some of the planning behind it. But his level only goes to a certain point. And this is another thing about whistleblowers, and this is something else that we keep in mind when we analyze the testimony that we do get, which is they all have levels at which they're, they have access, and their level cuts off at some point. So you cannot always know what they're telling you is the complete truth based on, as Richard Hoagland would say, there are many levels to the onion. Or, um, the lie is different at every level. Yeah, the lie is different at, at every level, and that really is 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 absolutely true. Um, so that you will get people who say, "Wait a minute, um, there's no such thing as Majestic 12 because I didn't know about them." And in this case, that's what Henry says. He he's never heard of Majestic 12. What is it? Uh, okay, Majestic 12 is uh, back back in the Truman. Okay, the storyline goes uh, back in the Truman administration. Um, a group of, of um, well, basically Illuminati were, uh, were given the task, um, scientists, engineers in mainly America, uh, put together supposedly 12. There, they've been, there are photographs of who the exact people were, people like uh, Werner Braun Vaughn. Braun Vaughn. Uh, uh, not sure if he was in the in Majestic 12. He wasn't. Yeah. Was, no. he, he wasn't. No, he um, wasn't. No. Uh, okay, um, I'm not going to argue with that. Um, and there, there are various people, like even, the, okay, in theory, um, someone like Einstein could be Majestic 12. Um, there were people in high places in government, in military, that were assembled to handle what was considered to be the ET problem or question. And from there on, they grew and basically stopped letting presidents know in America um, except as a need to know whatever they needed to know, and then the presidents really didn't have access. And this, this dovetails with the testimony of Dan Sherman, who is an intuitive communicator that was trained by the government, who was actually genetically engineered in his mother's womb before he was born, to handle what will be, according to what he was taught by the government, a shutdown um, electromagnetically across the planet at some point in the future. And he wasn't told when. Um, he's still alive. We, we have an interview with him. He's written a book called Above Black. Um, fascinating man. Um, very buttoned down. Doesn't want to reveal a lot, but he did quit the program, and then he began to be a whistleblower to tell people what was going on. Um, he was communicating with an alien, um, using a computer initially, eventually, um, not using the computer anymore. He had direct communication with the, that alien. Um, and, and, and he was trained to handle a situation in which our government would not be able to communicate with each other, the powers that be, and they were going to use humans stationed around the globe to communicate for some reason with off-planet um, intelligences during a time when there would be no electromagnetic communication. Yeah. The exact phrase in his book about black is that this was in preparation for a future time when all electronic communications would be rendered useless. And, that's, and he, was, he was told this 20 years ago. But as Kerry says, he wasn't told when. And the reason why we went on that little interesting detour is because this is further corroboration that the powers that be somehow knew or suspected or were trying to insure themselves against something that was coming down the line which they definitely didn't want us to know about because they felt that we couldn't handle it. Now, 
Going back into the Jake Simpson situation, let me just take two minutes to talk to our sponsor. We've got four minutes worth of tape left. We will have to pause just for a couple of seconds here to change tapes and things. Um, and that's going to be coming up very soon. Um, when we came across Jake's information, and, there's, and, and we've only just started here, because he started talking about what was known and what, was, what might be coming, and what he was in the know about, and what preparations had been made for it. And he was telling this in such detail that we ourselves thought, back in October, we thought, you know what? We don't know if we can release this. Because we started to wonder if we had a responsible duty to withhold this information, because it didn't sound good. Um, a few months later, we're kind of thinking, well, okay, um, we know a little bit more. We've had a lot of telephone conversations with the guy. He is emphasizing that it is not known what's going to happen. But what he basically said is that it has been known since the Second World War, uh, probably since the Second World War, he said. He suspects that this was the reason for Eisenhower's heart attack in 1955, um, shortly after his own meeting with the aliens, who were telling him something that might not have all been good news, that there was something coming at us, or relative, relative, relativistically speaking, we are like a ship in the solar system sailing into a storm as we go careering around the Milky Way at goodness knows what rate of speed. But we're sailing into something. Now this, this dovetails exactly again with what Dan Beerish reports is being told to us by the future humans that we're going to be entering in an area of energetic space that uh, the effect on the Earth is magnified by the man-made looking glasses and stargates. Jake didn't know about the man-made looking glasses and stargates, but he said his metaphor was, and the words that he used was, there is a wave coming. There is a wave coming. And in space, it doesn't matter whether you're coming at the wave or the wave's coming at you. I don't know which one either. But he said there's a wave that's going to hit us. And um, when we said when, he said, as far as he understands, it's not 2012, it's later. When we put to him the date that Bob Dean mentioned to us, now this is in connection with what he was told was Nibiru or Planet X, and Bob Dean gave a date of 2017, our man Jake Simpson said, that's probably or just about right. That's good news because maybe we've got a few more years. Dan Beerish never said 2012. Dan Beerish would only say round about now. Um, and Jake told us, how are we doing? We may not be the same on all three cameras. Um, so let's, why okay. don't we change them now? Why don't we change them now? And then we'll just pause at that dramatic point. Take a and, short then we'll, break. and then we'll carry on talking about what he <laughs> Um, so, just to reiterate now for those of you that are in conversation moving around, we're going to take a half hour. Uh, we have one hour left with Ken Lott, um, and half hour of that we're going to dedicate to questions from the audience. Um, we're going to also allow for um, uh, around 15 minutes for Miriam to speak, and um, she is going to join a panel at the very end. Uh, and then we have 15 minutes left to just wrap up what we've been telling you, um, you know, so that to continue on a little bit more with Jake, Jake Simpson and then um, wrap things up as closely, closely as we can. Ready to go? So we're going to talk about um, the super luminal craft um, that Jake Simpson <laughs> told us about. And uh, one thing I want to say that I, I was talking to somebody, um, actually Alfonso, and realized that we hadn't said, Jake Simpson is still working for uh, the man, the Illuminati. Um, he was actually in a meeting, a secret meeting he told us about in which, and this had to do with his rebellion and breaking from um, trying to get out of that, that whole business. And when he was, uh, he heard them referring to um, people as, you know, completely eliminate, um, what, what, what was his actual words, do you remember? I actually don't remember. Yeah, um, it, was, it was something so dire, uh, it was something so cold and, and just um, ruthless that he realized he had to, to get out. Um, so they made his life very uncomfortable. Um, and closed down some projects that he had been, been involved in. 
um, he got out of the situation, but he is called upon from time to time to do them a favor, quote unquote. Um, so I have to say that like many whistleblowers, you can never completely get out. And they are often um, highly surveilled, as we are. Um, I have to say that although we've had nothing um, super uh, bad happen to us directly, uh, there have been people that have had things happen as a result of association with us, such that, um, you know, like we had somebody who took over our website, who his place was broken into the next day, and he basically called us up and said he never wanted to have anything else to do with us. Um, now, we don't know for sure that that was just not a coincidence. Um, obviously, he felt it was a targeted situation. So I have to say that um, whereas we are protected, and Jake himself uh, got us in um, to, uh, to Thailand, and he has been monitoring our, our steps. Um, he's quite open about that. Um, he, in fact, will know exactly what we're doing today. Um, and uh, he, he's basically giving us his blessing. He's also made it possible for us to get through some immigration problems that we could have had. Um, so he's, he, we've also had assistance in those areas. But people that associate with us, um, it may be another matter. We just don't know. Okay. Back to Jake. One of the things that he told us, and this will uh, this will be fun for the aerospace buffs in the crowd here. He told us about the TR3B, the three triangle, and uh, he said that um, this thing can travel from geostationary orbit, which is 22,300 miles up, to treetop height in one two, three, four, five seconds. And I said, wow, that's something else. And I said, hey, how do you know that? He said, I was counting. <laughs> okay. And uh, I later figured it out. That's 16 million miles per hour. He said, look, this doesn't travel in space. This doesn't travel in space. You know, this is a space-time jump operation, that kind of thing. And you can't see it anymore. These things can travel outside of our solar system if they want to, or even larger versions can. This is all part of the 10,000 years ahead of regular physics um, uh, context that he told us about. And that's just a fun story for the airspace buffs, of which I am one. But what he told us about the wave that was coming, which is where we were at just before the break, one of the things I asked him was, well, how do they know about this thing? And this can be answered on a number of different levels. Um, one of his responses to that was they'd been out to take a look. They'd been out in this, quote, in their superluminal craft. They'd been out to take a look at this thing and they'd come back to report what it was that they measured or that they saw. And uh, that impressed me. It's a very straightforward, matter of fact answer. And it's actually, well, yeah, you know, if the. Um, uh, if you're sitting in Florida and there's a, um, there's a storm coming in, there's a hurricane coming in, then maybe you go out and take a look and see where it is, and then you come back and you say, you know what, it's going to be here in three days. Uh, now, he did not know, this is to repeat what we said before, he didn't know when this thing was coming, and he didn't know what would happen when it did come, and it's very, very important to stress that he said that, that, that nobody knows what's going to happen. The ETs don't know. Um, he said it could be just a puff of wind and then it's all over. You know. Or he said, you know, it could be, um, uh, he's the only other person that we have come across who said exactly what George Green said about the 400 mile an hour winds. He said exactly the same thing. He said, uh, he said this is the kind of thing that, that, that could occur. Whether it will occur or not, is a completely different matter. And what Jake was saying was being done about this was something that was not news to us or will be news to anyone in this room. He said that ever since they found out about this stuff, which is pretty much around about the Second World War, the military have been doing what it is that they do best, which is they dig in and start being defensive. 
And so they started tunneling in and making all their big trillions of dollars worth of investment in their underground bases. And one of the things he told us was that in some locations, when they were excavating these giant bases that they've got, they broke into older bases that were there, deep underground, which had not been built by us. Woohoo! Oh yeah. And, and, and what he said was, and we had not heard this anywhere before, he said that these bases were thousands of years old and had evidently been excavate, excavated by our predecessors in their response to the similar situation that occurred in their world 12,000 years ago. Okay. Now you correlate that with all the myths of the Great Flood that exist in 88 different cultures, or however many it is now, and uh, Plato, Plato's report of the sinking of Atlantis, and he was a good historian, he never got anything wrong. And um, uh, something happened back then. There's a huge amount of circumstantial evidence, and some would say quite solid evidence, to suggest that a long time ago, we had, before our current civilization, there was a, there was a prior civilization that had its own high technology that might have been based on slightly different stuff than we've got here, but they were faced with exactly the same problems because these problems are cyclical. And the cyclical problems are connected with the solar system's roller coaster journey <coughs> around the Milky Way as it goes up and down like a rock, uh, uh, like a um, like the horses in the merry-go-round, going round and round and round and round and up and down and up and down. And every time it crosses the galactic plane, it it it, it there seems to be some problematic thing that happens um, that is connected with energetic space, and this does also link in with what other commentators, particularly David Wilcott and others, David's a good friend of ours, we know him very well, uh, have commented about the fact that this is not necessarily always bad news. This energetic space that, that, uh, that we travel through regularly is also maybe something that prompts um, uh, changes in our DNA, changes in the way that our consciousness functions, changes in the way that we're able to access and process information, um, Personally, uh, I wouldn't take it any further than that, but I, I do personally believe that there is some evidence to suggest, quite some circumstantial evidence to suggest, that not only are there earth changes, but there are consciousness changes, and all of this stuff is happening at the same time. One of the things that Henry Deacon told us when we first met him back in, when was it, September 2006, he said, the problem is that everything is happening at the same time. It's all converging. It's all coming together. Um, he didn't say what everything, in inverted commas, was, but he was, he was emphasizing over and over again that the problems are multiple. This is one of the reasons why they're so, why they're so confusing. Um, yeah, and I wanted to say that um, Henry Deacon, from the early, um, the time we met him, he has been um, absolutely adamant in terms of what he was told by the government while he was working for Black Projects, how they were informed that these things were coming, and therefore that it, on the more negative side of the timeline, and that they needed to be prepared for. And so one of the things that Henry has been doing has been telling us about things like buying a car that is old enough not to be containing um, an engine management system an engine man so that the government the powers that be cannot drive your car for you and also so that it cannot be affected by the uh, you know the, the CMEs that come off the Sun um, when the Sun starts to, to get very active which he said was going to be in, uh, inevitable um, he he basically is, is operating and many people from black black projects it's almost like if you will, a form of programming, I have to say, in which they are told there is a rollout. And it's basically the agenda, as George Green has, has laid it out to you. And that's why you get so many of the same reports. Um, now, a lot of the agenda items haven't actually happened yet, but as you see, the, the, the ball is starting to roll. Certainly, the, the economy going down is, is, is maybe the tipping point. 
So um, he has been cautioning, cautioning us for two years to find a safe place, to do this, to do that, and make all these preparations for what he, he feels he's completely convinced is coming, and that's absolutely inevitable. Um, interestingly enough, we put him in touch with um, David Wilcock, and some of you will, will be familiar with David, um, maybe uh, a reincarnation of Edgar Casey, depending on your point of view. David is very optimistic. David believes in ascension. David believes that consciousness is changing, that there's you know, something very positive coming out of all of this. Henry and David had a wonderful meeting of the minds. They've talked for hours and hours and hours. Uh, David was just on Coast to Coast reporting on a lot of our Henry Deacon testimony, things that Henry has told him about you know, human-looking aliens that are working in the government. We've also gotten that same testimony from Bob Dean, who, um, you know, is an elder statesman and an ex-military man, uh, who, who is definitely in the know as to what's going on behind the scenes with the government. Um, so what's very interesting is to see a black project person like our Henry Deacon uh, get in touch with someone like David Wilcock and also resonate with some of the things that David is saying in terms of, look, it's not all dire. Um, so, so, so that's an interesting sort of side light to, to what goes on. Um, what we do try to do is put some of our whistleblowers in touch with our other contacts. And often they strike up wonderful um, friendships and there are meetings of the minds and, and sometimes they can put two and two together also um, among themselves. Uh, we also put George in touch with um, Jake Simpson, for example. So they've had some dialogue. Um, Jake, for example, resonates very strongly with everything George is saying um, and wants to, you know, uh, sort of go further along that, that line with George because George is, is very instrumental in sort of making plans for what can we do? If all of this is coming, what can we do? And that's actually the, the next step that we want to talk about before we open up for questions. <coughs> Um, we created another website, it's called projectavalon.net, uh, a few months ago. It has a forum in which what our objective was, was to, once we stated the problem with Camelot and described the problem, what we wanted to do, is, wanted to do was create solutions, or possible solutions, and connect people so that they could find safe places if they felt that was necessary. So again, Project Avalon is set up to do that. And uh, I mentioned it before. Uh, do you want to talk it, about it in general in any way? Yeah. Um, it was inspired really by our interview with George Green that, that we, uh, that I think it was dated last, last April, and we were so struck by his ground crew messages that, um, and it resonated with us so strongly. The message of 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 I, uh, I'm just trying to think how to put it all into a, just a single sentence. Um, it's a message of hope against a backdrop of bad news. If you, if you like. In other words, we can do something about it, but we have to start now, and we have to connect with people, we have to work together, we have to form communities, we have to be smart, we have to be informed, and then we're in with a chance. You know. Now, to me, that sounds like a like the kind of thing that a coach would say before an important game. That's the kind of thing that's getting me motivated to play my best. You know. Other people might say, "Hey, I quit," but some people are going to quit, and some people are going to are going to. Um, step up to the plate and to produce their very, very best at this time. One of my favorite movies, um, some, of you, some of you may know this, it's dated now actually, this is the Jeff Bridges called Starman. Anyone seen Starman? Hey, wow, okay, so I, I love that. Um, one of the things he says at the very, very end, and, and the story of Starman, it, it, so this is an alien um, who's taken on a human body um, and he's on the run from the spooks who are trying to grab him and so on and so forth. And he's saying towards the end of the movie what, what he has learned from his short time operating as a human being on this planet. And his summary is he says, the thing that is really wonderful about you 
is that when things are at their worst, you are at your best. Such a living line. Um, that, that had a huge impact on me, because it's so true. And we have that capacity to, to step up to the plate, forgive the American baseball term here, I'm, I'm, I'm English and I prefer cricket, um, but there's, um, it's got something to do with rising to the occasion, it's got something to do with responding to the challenge, and we can do this. Talk about Avalon. No, no, no. You want me to talk about Avalon? Okay, right. So it's about connecting with people. Yeah. It's about connecting with people, it's about synergy, it's about the fact that um, individually we may fall, but together we may stand. You know. um, and there are groups that are forming all over the world. We called this what George has called in his wonderful little book. Where is it? We don't have it. No. Methodist, Methodist for the ground crew. You are the ground crew. We are the ground crew. Anyone else who's paying attention to what's going on here are the ground crew. And the message essentially is that the ground crew need to work together, they need to connect together, they need to form communities. Now a community isn't necessarily just a little group of people at the end of a muddy road, halfway up a mountain in Vilcabamba, growing their own vegetables and hoping for the best. That's not necessarily what a community is. You know. Now, that was, that was a little flip and I didn't mean it that way. But, but a community can also be a street. It can be the people in your apartment. It can be um, people who are connected with each other who meet regularly within the city. You don't have to relocate to Vilcabamba in order to operate. Somebody... Um, I th are they in this room? The, the, the person who um, said to me that they had been really worried about this, about where to go and what to do and what action to take and what country should they be in and what community should they join. And on the Avalon Forum, when this was being debated, one of the, uh, one of the messages that they got that changed their whole outlook was, it's not where you are, it's what you are. Okay. And um, that person who reported that wonderful story to me, I think, yeah, beautiful. Did I tell that right? That's it. That's it. Okay. And there are other versions of that. It's not necessarily a question of um, uh, how many gold coins you've got in your pocket and whether you know how to grow vegetables. It's not about that. It's about your relationships with people. It's about whether you can make things work, whether you can form teams with people, whether your response to a crisis is, oh my God, what am I going to do for myself? Or, oh my God, what am I going to do about everyone else? One of the stories which I love, which is inspiring, I believe this was told in a wonderful book that inspired me a long time ago called The Holographic Universe by Michael Tolbert. Who's read that? A lot of you, I'm sure. Do you remember the story that he told about the research that had been done and the miracles that had taken place at Lourdes? Mm -hmm. And uh, because some people do receive miraculous curing um, at Lourdes. And a bunch of psychologists started to interview people who had received these, uh, these healings and some people who hadn't because it was useful to know how come it works sometimes and how come it doesn't work at other times? What they found out was that the people who had received healings were the people who had prayed for a healing for somebody else. Okay. Isn't that a wonderful story? And the lovely catch-22 about that is you can't fake that, you see. Groucho Marx once said, honesty and integrity make the world go round, and if you can fake that, you've got it made. Okay. You can't fake a prayer that someone else will get healed, hoping that you're going to get the benefit. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be real, you see. And it's that, that, that lifting of ourselves up to be the highest and the best that we can be, so that we're not going into this situation thinking, how can I save my own situation? You're going in there saying, what can I do that's best for the human race? What, what can I do that's best for everyone around me? And if we do that, if all of us do that, if enough of us do that, around the world at the same time, this is what's going to save the situation in my own estimation. It's not a matter of sitting in power spots and meditating and doing, you know. It's, it's not a question of ritual activity. It's a question of intentional action that's coming from the very highest place within inside you. And for those of you who are saying, asking yourself and asking other people, what can I do, what can I do? Do what we did a long time ago in our naivety, in our ignorance. We just started something not knowing where it was going to go. 
but we just started by taking that first step. We didn't know where it was going to go. But you do what you can do by taking that first step. Whatever you can do, do it. It doesn't really matter. Talk to someone in the bus. Talk to someone in the plane. Start writing letters to people. Open up a website. Start contributing to the Avalon Forum. Do whatever you can do. You know what you can do. We don't. And so but it's intentional action coming from the highest place of, 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 of contribution. That's what's going to get us out of this mess. And timelines can be changed. It's not fixed. It's not determined. No one knows what's going to happen. And this is good news that no one knows what's going to happen. Using video equipment and 
so forth, but they've been able to uh, respect the wishes of those whom they have interviewed uh, regarding what's on the record and what's off the record. And that it doesn't necessarily have to fit within a sound bite. And so we have uh, now for the next three hours, three and a half hours during this conference, you're going to hear from them. And you're going to hear some of the, the sharings and stories. And I, I, I'm just so glad that you decided to come, Carrie and Bill and Kay. And uh, you're, you're on. Bill, Ryan, Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot. Just a moment here, we're going to get ourselves wired up for sound. Oh, okay, yeah, we have to grab them. Uh, loose. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we're both on short leashes here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not our accustomed style. <laughs> Especially not me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a little too wild to leash, but at any rate. Okay, so uh, you want to start because you're always... Very we actually had something to do. It wasn't just a blank sheet of paper. Um, Brian just now has mentioned the Disclosure Project, and we do not know Stephen Greer. We've never met him. We've never corresponded with him. We've never run across him in any of the conferences or on any of our travels. We would love to do that. Um, we, don't know, we don't know how he regards us. We don't even know if he knows about us. Um, but like many of you, probably, I personally was inspired um, by the, uh, the 2001 Washington press conference, I think it was in May 2001, um, when Stephen Greer uh, did a very impressive presentation in front of a lot of invited mainstream media and presenting over a period of several hours uh, quite a number of people, some of whom have later become our own camera witnesses. And I remember this vividly because that I was driving in Scotland at the time, very late at night, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and this thing was being reported live by, um, on the radio. And I was so fascinated by what was happening, I could barely believe it. I stopped the car and I listened to it at the time. Um, um, sorry. Uh, actually, this is so typical. We're having some anomalous uh, sound effects in the background, and they've cut out now. So maybe you need to hold the mic a certain way, but... Yeah. Um, uh, Maybe hold it up there. Okay. Thank you. Um, exactly. And as many of you probably have done, I found myself asking, well, what happened to the Disclosure Project? What happened to the videos that they promised to release? Right. What happened as, a, as an outcome of what seemed to be such a huge promise that was, that was, that was made publicly back in 2001? Now, I don't intend to even try and answer that question, and there's absolutely no implied criticism. But in, uh, to use the jargon of one of my careers prior to Camelot, which is actually working in business and consultancy, there seemed to be a gap in the market. Um, <laughs> now, now I would actually say, as one of my... One of my... Uh, uh, using the jargon from another one of my careers as a team building specialist and a team building consultant, there's actually room for more people in this team. And we need as many people as possible putting their shoulders to the wheel to get this information out. And so this, so I thought, well, you know, um, we're not trying to supplant the guy, we're not trying to, to interfere with his intentions, but actually there are people out there waiting for information. So um, Kerry has a little camera, which I could probably fit in the trouser pocket here, and so let's go, you know. And in my experience with the Serpo project, and let me give a nod to that, because some of you may not know about it, some of you may have read about it, some of you may have read criticism about it, it's all very weird. It involves um, a purported claimed uh, US alien exchange program that happened back in the 60s and 70s. Um, I became tangled up in this because just like you guys here, I was in the metaphorical audience when uh, attached to a newsletter, uh, to um, an email news group, where this material about this US alien exchange program was being released from an anonymous source. 
And somebody in that news group said, you know what, this is interesting information here, we need to archive this on a website. And I was dumb enough to say, hey, I can do that, I've got time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I became the webmaster for this release of information that was coming from sources within the, Defen the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. This is a very, very long story, which we don't involve, but there was something behind that. I got tangled up with a whole lot of people from the intelligence community. There was interference from behind the black curtain. Uh, we ended up having an encounter with, um, with one of the retired reserve astronauts who, who didn't go on the program. We, we've got a fascinating story about that. We actually met these people. It's all very real. It did happen. It certainly didn't happen like it was said on the website, but there was something going on. And just leaping ahead to what we'll be talking about later on this in Cornwall, some of you may have had the same experience. It was one of those things. It didn't take hours and hours of agonizing strategic planning. The whole thing was completely visualized, visualized and agreed with, with a spontaneous, obvious synergy between us in probably about two minutes for that. We just spelled out between us the vision um, in, in the very broadest general terms. And within, a, literally, I think within one or two or three minutes, we had agreed that this is what we were going to do. And there wasn't the slightest bit of doubt. Um, if we had stopped to think about it, <laughs> then we would have thought all about the yes buts and the hang on a minutes and, why, how, and how are we going to. Um, Finances and suddenly they're trying to kill us and all this kind of stuff. And this never even crossed our mind. It just sounded like fun. And actually that spirit of fun and what the heck, let's do it, has actually been what's behind this whole thing in, in the last two and a half years. And, I mean, but at that time, we didn't envisage anything that was this large. We couldn't possibly have imagined that here we were in Vilcabamba, just a few feet away from somebody who is, who is who is a um, uh, widely respected throughout the world as, um, as a visionary and a physicist and an astronaut and in a different timeline might have ended up as being the first person officially to have set foot on Mars and so on and so forth. And I mean, it's become so big, the whole thing has just evolved in front of us, like we're on oiled wheels with someone else doing the steering and someone else doing the powering. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as, um, as we have the opportunity during the day, that we take very little credit for anything that's happened here. Um, in retrospect, you can look back and we can see that we make a great show. You know, I mean, it's like we've got the, uh, the Mulder and Scully, we've got the two different personality types, we've got the, the man and the woman, the American and the Brit, we've got the skeptic and the, well, the slightly skeptic more skeptic and the slightly more esoteric, um, and we make quite a good stand-up team, you know. Um, <laughs> but we never thought I don't think you should be complimenting us, that's really embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, but I have to say that also, I just, I know people are going to ask this, and people have been asking us for ages, why do we have the cheetah? And the reason is, is because what happened was we ended up um, going to Africa because Bill was born in Africa and he was able to take me on safari. And I, one of the reasons I even came to visit Bill in England initially was because I knew that he knew about Africa, and I am an avid fan of Africa, I guess you might say, and um, of Egypt. And so um, we set out on a safari um, very early on in, um, in our travels as a kind of a break that we would take. And so um, one of the times we were out there, I was able to shoot um, a cheetah, a real life cheetah that was, you know, a young cheetah and beautiful, beautiful animal. And we spent hours uh, video, videotaping him. And then um, when we were creating a logo for Camelot, um, I, was, I was actually, because I came from Hollywood, it was, um, it was my kind of smart ass nod, if you will, to MGM. Uh, the, the, M, the MGM Lion, <laughs> which is very, very famous, I think, uh, as a symbol of Hollywood. And, you know, at the beginning of motion pictures. And of course, I always wanted to make movies, so I thought putting that as our logo in the beginning of our um, 
videos was kind of a statement. Um, also the concentration on the eye, if you've seen our logo. I don't have my t-shirt on, but it, our logo. And um, the eye being that we are watching you just as you're watching us, kind of a nod to the government in that respect. So that's why we have the cheetah logo. And cheetahs are faster, and we the internet was our medium, and therefore we're, we're lighter, faster uh, than the uh, MGM logo. Indeed you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, when we actually started Camelot, we had very good at, at the <coughs> overview type. Uh... Do I want to start? Okay. Um, we have a lot of stories to tell, by the way. Um, some of which we haven't really told before, either because they're very funny or they're against us. And we've actually got to the point here where we're very happy to to uh, to tell a lot of stories against us. And <laughs> one of the ones that I really like, I really love it, is um, we had an email from somebody a few months ago. He said, "You know what? I." <laughs> I was sure that you guys must have been a CIA operation, you must have been sponsored by those guys, but then I realized actually that the videos were so amateurish that you couldn't possibly... Can <laughs> <laughs> I take offense at that? <laughs> That's his story. <laughs> and my first encounter with Kerry Cassidy was when, was when um, I was speaking um, for my own particular sins at the Lofton UFO <laughs> conference in uh, at the end of February in uh, 2006 because I got tangled up in a really weird story that I'm happy to say a few words about but not more than a few um, when I was basically talking about um, a disclosure program that I had got myself inadvertently wrapped up with and I was being interviewed by several people the first time I've been ever by, interviewed by anybody and um, it's like at five o'clock in the afternoon, I was being interviewed by, by some guy and he brought his lights in and his cameras and he had a camera here and a big tripod and a camera there and he had all these microphones and he spent about 15 minutes setting it all up and this was for some kind of TV deal and I never even made note of what it was or who it was or something. And that was at five o'clock and then at six o'clock I was with Kerry and Kerry came in with this tiny little camera, <laughs> put it on this tiny little tripod <laughs> And, and I thought, where's the rest of this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and then Kerry started talking to me. And, um, and that was it. And what I want to say about that is that this is the spirit in which, in which Camelot started. It started in the way that we would both encourage anybody else to start anything which is that you pick up whatever it is you happen to have, even if it's just your own courage in your hands and nothing else, and start. And what's really important is the vision that you hold. And I want to acknowledge Kerry here, because really, in as much as anything has a, has a bit of a lineage, and you can go back and back and back, and where did it really start? But Kerry started the vision that was Camelot because of her own history with Hollywood um, way back prior to October 2005, when she got frustrated with the whole business and said, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, well, actually, so let's back up because as much as I like to take credit for things, um, I have to say that Camelot started with Camelot, um, the real Camelot in the early days. And um, we were both very inspired by that. And um, as it happened, I did interview him in La at Laughlin. Um, actually, initially I thought he represented the Serpo project. You know, how interesting can that be? He's not actually the whistleblower. He's not actually the one telling the story. So I wasn't really excited to interview him. And when I first went up to interview him, he kind of hemmed and hawed and said, well, maybe I'll have time later tonight. And then he said he wouldn't. Then he said he would. Um, but initially, he had on email agreed to be interviewed. So uh, the interview did happen. And I was very impressed because he was very, um, 
balanced. He, although he was a spokesperson for the Serpo project, in a sense, because he built the website, not because he had anything to do with it in particular, and it was an alien exchange program that our government was involved in back in the early 60s, supposedly, by the way. And it's online in case you want to investigate further. Um, but basically, he was very balanced in the way he handled the questions. And I threw some, some, um, some, some real left jabs, whatever you want to call it, um, right to, folks, <laughs> to kind of uh, see how riled he would get and to get to the root of the story, which is kind of my way in case you've watched the videos. And um, he handled it very well. He, he actually had a, had a calm sense of humor about it. He, he didn't get defensive. And this, this counted for a lot with me. And uh, we eventually, we went to dinner. Um, we, we started talking, comparing notes. Um, we've both been researching um, incredible amounts of, of material, conspiracies, you name it, UFOs. Um, metaphysics, uh, spiritual disciplines, all our lives up until that point. So we both had quite a backlog, and it ended up that we had quite a bit in common. Uh, then I went on a trip to Egypt. My mother had passed away, left me a small inheritance, which eventually financed Camelot for almost two years. And um, I, I went to Egypt uh, with uh, actually Jordan Maxwell and William Henry, wow. and I, that's where I interviewed Jordan very briefly. Um, that was, still Camelot hadn't begun, um, and on the way back from Egypt, I, I was in touch with Bill, we kept in touch over the emails, and I, um, and we arranged that I would come to um, England to visit him, and uh, so I did, and, and we ended up going to Stonehenge, to a lot of power places in England, and we went to Tintagel, one of the um, supposed homes of King Arthur. And when we went to Tintagel, I don't know if you've ever been there, it's, it's a really stunning, absolutely stunning place on the, on the coast, and um, has a lot of uh, mystical and uh, interesting power around it. And uh, we were, were really struck by it, and we started talking about what could we do. Here we both had this incredible backgrounds, and, and Bill is a webmaster, myself is a filmmaker, we were both writers, we both had spiritual backgrounds. And we said, what can we do to absolutely change the paradigm that was going on and, and actually maybe force disclosure? So um, right then and there we created Camelot and both of us were very inspired by the King Arthur round table concept where there were no um, leaders and followers per se, but that um, in the spirit of Arthur, uh, you know, everyone came to the table, it, it was all balanced, there were no hierarchies, mm -hmm. and um, worked together for what could be a better ver vision of the future. And I believe that that was the initial King Arthur vision, and I do believe that both of us lived back in those times. And both of us were tapping into that uh, when we connected. And that hasn't changed, so um, it's very remarkable that uh, Mayor has these lovely um, Arthur-like visions and uh, the sword and, and all of that going on. And um, it was also a synchronicity, you know, that John F. Kennedy and, you know, sort of a vision of a better future that was at least implied, if not carried out, um, you know, when he was president, was also um, sort of um, an echo, if you will, out there, and, and we decided to call it Project Camelot because Project being um, sort of the, the forerunning name that most deep black projects contain. I, I worked for a short time at um, JPL uh, for NASA and um, helping in, in media, and uh, I, I, I was writing a screenplay called Project Moon Dust. I, I worked in Hollywood for like 20 years, and um, I was trying to pitch projects, sci-fi projects, uh, to open minds and change the paradigm, and getting absolutely nowhere. And that's why I picked up a, a home, you know, non-professional camcorder and just said, screw it, I'm going to make a, a documentary, and I'm going to go interview these people at UFO conferences because they got something to say, and I want the world to hear it. Um, so that whole thing just took off, and then we, we also, by synchronicity, Bill was in touch with Mr. X. Yeah. Um, just to say a little bit about that, that, that envisioning 
and, and sort of initial actualization, the planting of the seed that is Camelot, um, when we were at Tintagen, 